Alrighty. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to Google, and thank you all so much for coming. My name is Jeff Buchan, um, and I work on the industry relations team here at Google. I'm also a proud board member of the Manhattan Chamber of Commerce, um, and really proud to be partnering with these guys on such a fabulous event today. Um, first of all, I want to start with a big thank you to Nancy, Laura, there we go, I'll step back from it, uh, to Nancy, Laura, Mads, and the entire Manhattan Chamber team. Um, they've all put in a tremendous amount of work to make today possible, um, and we're really grateful for all that hard work. Thank you. Um, yes, round of applause for that. So data is revolutionizing the way that organizations operate and the way that people live their everyday lives. Um, it's data that made uh, possible two Stanford graduate students in a garage in Menlo's, Menlo Park um, being able to organize the world's information and make it accessible to anyone with an internet connection. Um, but we also know that uh, this type of innovation is not just taking place in Silicon Valley. It's taking place across the entire country and especially here in New York City. So really excited today to have an absolutely stellar group of speakers today experts in their fields across all different types of industries, all different types of organizations, talking about how they're using data, um, you know, how they're pioneering and using this, these new um, methods to really leverage data for their organization and, and driving results. Um, so really excited to, to hear such a great um, collection of speakers. Um, a few quick logistics, and then I'll hand it over to Nancy. Um, first of which is the program's going to run from 2 to 5 p.m., and then we'll be followed by a reception from 5 to 7 p.m. in the same space. So we hope all of you are able to stay for the reception as well. Um, when you entered, you should have received passes. Just keep them on while you're in the building so we don't have any issues with, um, with security. Um, the restrooms are in the back, so women's right there, men's right there if you need it. Uh, we also have Wi-Fi. The network to use is Google Guest. You can connect to that and you don't, you don't need a password. Um, we also have a, um, a hashtag for the event. So you can see it up on the screen. It'll be up there all day. It's a hashtag MCC Big Data. So if you're uh, commenting on social media um, and can use the hashtag, that would be awesome. And uh, that is pretty much it. So um, thank you all for coming. And I look forward to meeting you during the reception. OK, so before I start, I just want to point out the difference. Me, Jeff. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a little slow in the uptake. Okay. Thank you very much, Jeff. I'm Nancy Plager. I'm the president of the Manhattan Chamber of Commerce. We want to welcome you today. It's a very, very exciting panel, and this was an idea that Jeff came up with, and we sat down and we talked about all the different meetings that Big Data has, grouped them into the <clears throat> panels that you'll be hearing from today, and then went out and got the panelists, who I think you will agree are very impressive, and we're going to hear a lot of interesting things, updated things, forward-thinking things today. So we hope uh, you all enjoy it and take back some of these tips. We might be able to even help you think about your business and your future and what big data means to you and can mean to you and your clients. So we want to thank Google very much for hosting this, for being a part of this innovative idea to really stretch out what is big data so we can all discuss it. And I want to particularly thank Jeff, who spent a lot of time and effort in putting this together. So please put your hands together and thank Google. Thank uh, we're very happy today. Our chairman, Ken Biveri, is up in the back. Say hi, Ken. Hey, Ken. I'm happy that he could join us as well. Um, again, if you're not part of our chamber, feel free to, to welcome um, and to speak to us this afternoon at the reception. My colleagues that checked you in downstairs will be here. Laura Bucko, our VP of Communications, is here. And we'll be happy to talk to you more about all of the uh, exciting things that our chamber does from an advocacy, education, and connection standpoint. Uh, without further ado, to get the ball rolling, we want to welcome a very impressive uh, uh, keynote speaker today. And I'm sure you will uh, really be amazed at all of the things that she's going to tell us. Uh, Rachel is, and all of the bios, uh, brief bios are uh, on the program, I believe. If not, uh, Rachel is the Chief Digital Officer and Deputy Secretary for Technology for New York State. Uh, her vi focus is to realize Governor Cuomo's vision for modernizing government, enhancing customer service, and enabling innovation through all of the state's digital touch points. Prior to this role, Rachel was New York City's chief digital officer under Mayor Bloomberg from 2011 to 2013. And before entering government, Rachel served as a founder and CEO of groundreport.com, an early citizen journal platform. 
She also ran Upward, which is a digital strategy consultancy, and taught at Columbia Business School. How old are you, Rachel? <laughs> Rachel's a World Economic Forum Young Global Leader and was named Chief Digital Officer of the Year 2014 at the CDO Summit. So please join me in welcoming Rachel Hoke. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, great. Hello, and good afternoon. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Good. Um, so I'm very excited to be here today. Obviously, um, you know, also incredibly grateful for all the innovations we have around data. My role itself would not exist if it weren't for all of the, you know, everything that has enabled and supported the transmission of data and this explosion. Um, that we've seen over the past 10 years. And I'm very excited to share a little bit today about what's happening at New York State and how hopefully everyone can be involved and, and what we can do to build on that further. So let's see if I've got my right clicker here. OK. Oops, got to go back. OK. So um, we also should have some time for questions at the end. So if you have any thoughts, please keep them in mind. So. I wanted to start with a question, which is, how does New York State invest in data-driven innovation? And this is something we think about quite a bit, because there's really two ways that we approach data as a state. And I'll talk about that really quickly, just to lay the groundwork for how we think about these things, because it can be overwhelming. The opportunities and the potential are limitless, but we only have so many hours in the day. And we only have so many resources, and we want to be economical. We're working with taxpayer dollars. So how do we prioritize and find out what's going to have the biggest impact for New Yorkers in everything that we do? So we have this basic pyramid that reflects how we think about innovation in New York State. And I'll walk through the steps um, to explain why we have placed things where they are. So at the bottom of the pyramid, that's the foundation. That's absolutely what you need to even get started. You can't have a digital state if you don't have the proper infrastructure. And that's why it's, it's, it's the first thing that we begin with. It's our, really our first step when we talk about digital innovation in New York State. The next piece is education. It's great if we have that connectivity, but it's only going to be effective if everyone is digitally literate and if everyone want, knows what to do with these new opportunities, with these new technologies. And education for us covers everything from basic digital literacy all the way up through the ability to get your PhD in computer science or data sciences. We know that we need to enable the public to have great opportunities to educate itself if we're going to do a good job on all these other fronts and if also we're going to support an industry and an academic sector that's coming up with great innovations that help us to do our job better in governing and serving the public. The third piece is data, what we're here to talk about today. So hopefully if we have that infrastructure in place, if we have that education, we have data scientists, we have people who know how to manipulate data or at least understand it and work with it, then we can enable the open data layer of what we do as government. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that means for us. The fourth piece is service. And this piece is where my team and I do an enormous amount of our execution on a day-to-day -day basis really rethinking how customer service works when you look at a data-driven approach as a state and when you look at creating what we think of as a truly user-centric experience, one that's been totally redesigned about around the citizen, not based on our own organizational structure or bureaucracy as government. And finally, industry. Hopefully, if we have those other four steps in place, we can be enabling industry. So to go back to the initial setup, Data is in the middle not because we think it's the third most important thing, but because without the infrastructure and the education, we really don't see how we can have a successful effort when it comes to data. And that's the piece there. So this is our process that speaks to our holistic view on innovation in New York State, how we approach it, starting from the ground up. But there's another way that we look at it that I think is really important to notice, because just because data is the third step doesn't mean we're ignoring it when it comes to infrastructure and education. On the contrary, in addition to having the structure, if you were to look at the pyramid and you're looking at the building blocks that build up every single piece of this pyramid, data is key. It's really the only way that we can measure if what we're doing is working 
and we can unlock opportunities for it to go beyond what we just do within our own world as government and allow third parties in the outside world to collaborate with us and build on that further. So I'll walk through a little bit of what we're doing in each of these areas so that we can get a better sense of what this really means. So infrastructure. I was so thrilled last year um, when, uh, or I guess at the beginning of this year, when Governor Cuomo announced his Broadband for All initiative, um, truly a uh, historic announcement, the biggest of its kind, announcing that the state would put $500 million towards uh, an investment in universal broadband across New York State, making sure that everyone has the minimum capacity, but that we're supporting gigabit capacity and, and future growth for businesses. And this has been one of the most, uh, Perhaps, in, in my view, it's the most important thing that we as government can do. If we're looking at infrastructure challenges, broadband truly is the infrastructure challenge of our age. We're going to see more and more coming, and we're, we're embracing renewable energy sources and batteries and, and charging stations. All of that infrastructure is very important. But without broadband, we're never going to have intelligent systems. We're never going to have efficient systems where the enormous amount of data that lives in each of each of these systems or in all this infrastructure is being exchanged, analyzed, and used in a way that makes it very effective. That's important for infrastructure, but when we even look at small businesses, households, the huge gap between the experience of a young child growing up in a household that has no internet connectivity at home as opposed to one that does is going to have an enormous impact uh, on them throughout their academic years and further in their professional life. Now, I, I believe the number is around 80% of businesses only post jobs online. If you're not able to get online, you're at a huge disadvantage. A, a, a statistic that I believe Google put out into the world, um, but that certainly rings true to me, is that most people, when they're looking for a new business or service, 90% will go online. If you don't have a website, you're going to be losing out in terms of that business and that participation in the economy. So the fact that more than 5.4 million New Yorkers and more than 50,000 businesses do not have adequate broadband access is not acceptable. And not only that, they're just going to fall further and further behind if we don't make these very important investments now because on the global scale, the, the, the world is moving at an incredibly fast pace. We're seeing many other countries eclipsing the US in terms of their speeds, and we need to be very competitive if we're going to be successful. So how are we going to do it? Data, of course, is absolutely key. Our broadband office has a very rigorous data collection and analysis program as part of their process, and that's why they're constantly um, analyzing. Now, if you want to participate, we have a way for you to do that. On our website, you're able to report an unserved address. You can report your own broadband speeds that you have at your home, and you can also get broadband data. It's an amazing tool that you can look at connectivity of all different sorts. To give an example of some of the maps that we do have, I, I put in you know, our address for our, our office in New York City. And here we have the overlay, I believe it's Time Warner Cable. But you can look up every single um, internet service provider, um, as well as uh, maps of cell connectivity across the state online. And we're not just putting this out there to show that we are keeping our ISPs accountable and we're making sure that we are mapping and aware of what's happening. We're doing this because this is the same data that we use internally to chart our own plans and to make sure that we're constantly improving on New York State's broadband infrastructure footprint. So the next piece, education. There is so much that we can do in education in order to make sure that we're nurturing and supporting the next generation of data scientists. And just to give a couple examples very quickly, um, one of the most recent programs that the governor announced, building on a successful data science program at University of Rochester, this was just a few months ago, is the Vista Collaboratory. It is a massive, it is a screen um, uh, uh, that uh, renders massive data sets in real time. It's enabling all kinds of health insights, and we're working very closely with the University of Rochester, who are um, integrating it into their curriculum as they train the next generation of data scientists. But as we know, the basics for data science can start 
at you know even the kindergarten level. And investing in STEM education is something that Governor Cuomo is very passionate about. If you look at the recent STEM scholarships, I don't know if anyone here is aware of these, but if you know anyone who is in high school and going to be graduating and interested at all in STEM, this is an opportunity where if you are in the top 10% of your graduating class and you commit to working in New York State for five years after graduation, you can get a full ride to any SUNY or CUNY school um, if you study a STEM topic. And STEM, of course, meaning science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And what's great about this is that not only are we encouraging people to take advantage of the world-class SUNY and CUNY institutions, not only are we encouraging them to study STEM topics, but we're also encouraging them to stay in New York State bring those innovations to life here and help us to create the next generation of, of what we're going to help, you know, how we're going to address some of the hardest problems that people face today. So open data for innovation. And this is an area that we're extremely passionate about. So the way that we approach open, uh, open data is our goal is to unlock and make available to the public as much data as we possibly can um, excluding only uh, sensitive and personally identifiable information because we believe that this is data that belongs to the public, it allows the public to make more informed decisions, and it also creates opportunities for third party groups to improve on the way that perhaps we analyze it or we make it available to the public by creating, whether it could be an app, it could be uh, a website, there's a huge number of different opportunities that we've already seen come to life. So. Today, OpenNY is uh, <laughs> launched in 2013. Today, we have over 1,200 data, set, data sets from more than 60 different agencies, such a huge range of, of different types of information, which we'll talk about very briefly. And there are more than 100 million records. I think it's actually closer to 120 million records that are contained in, that, in those data sets. It is one of the, if not the most robust, open data initiatives uh, run by a state in the country and reflects an enormous amount of uh, collaboration across state agencies. We also have some of the highest data integrity uh, processes that, that have been seen. We've been praised uh, by various CIO or organizations, and our, our uh, chief data officer, Barbara Cohn, is really responsible for that and runs, runs a great operation. As you can see, this is some of the improvement. It's not easy. Often these data initiatives, they come on top of many different other responsibilities that state staff can have. They are not accompanied with additional resources or budget, and yet they make it work, they see the opportunity, and we've made this available to the public. To get a sense of what you'll find in the state's open data re um, platform, you can take a look at the breakdown here. And I'm not sure if you can see on the screens, but that huge, large blue section is health. New York State is... Uh, uh, inarguably uh, the leader in providing public health data and releases enormous amount of data that helps people to make more informed decisions and creates enormous accountability in the incredibly important area of healthcare. We also have a very wide range of different data types. So you'll see we have everything from charts and maps, um, a, a really uh, diverse number of, of options. We have some APIs, APIs of course being application programming interfaces which allow us to share that data in real time. We always want to be expanding on our APIs and that's our number one priority. So what will you find there? Just to make it a little bit more real and tangible to folks, here's a few examples from that open data platform. So here we have hospital acquired infections beginning 2008. A, an incredibly important topic that uh, perhaps if you wanted to look for this 10, 20 years ago, it would be enormously complicated to track down all this information from many different sources, from many different hospitals. It's all there. It's constantly updated um, at the touch of a button, and you can, and you can, you can access it any time on the OpenNY platform. Another sample. I, I was just exploring what I could find on the, on the OpenNY platform, the canal system locks. We have a wide number of maps. Geographic data is one of the most highly requested uh, data types that we have, and this is a good example of, 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 a, of the map view that you'll find that is accessible as well to the layman as well. You don't have to be a data scientist to analyze this. Here we have some of our, um, our solar uh, power incentive program. 
uh, organized by a wide array of different indicators. And in a moment, I'll show how we have recently launched something new called Data Lens, which allows us to make this even more uh, comprehensive, even easier to access than it is now. So introducing Data Lens. This is something we're really excited to have recently rolled out in the last quarter. And so here, here's basically the before. This is the standard view if you're accessing the website. Again, if you're not a da data scientist, it might be harder for you to really glean a lot of insights out of this view. But what's great about Data Lens is it allows you to filter and manipulate data at the click of a button. Um, and what were previously very complex interactions are made very simple and very straightforward. So through the Data Lens, here's an example of that same data that we were just looking at illustrated and conveyed in a number of different views. So instead of just telling you the latitude and longitude coordinates, which perhaps is not as usable, now we've got it rendered on the screen. We have uh, heat maps uh, according to county. We have heat maps according to zip codes. We're able to look at uh, bar and, and line graphs so we can see trends over time. So we're constantly trying to take that next step because what I found in my work both at the city and the state with data is that it's not necessarily true that if you build it, they will come. When it comes to the public who may not be technical, who may not be in a position to manipulate data or know how to analyze data, you have to create user-friendly tools. And this is what service is all about, customer service and citizen engagement. And that's why we're so excited about this, this new opportunity. Beyond that, you can also make it personal. So you can look, for example, at the data lens view filtered by county. You, you know, people want to know what's happening in their own backyards. And this is finally enabled by this view. And further, you can take it by the county and then pick out a specific metric. So here we have um, with lease, the, the lease um, metric of, of the solar power incentive program identified. So this is something we're incredibly excited about. We encourage people to check it out and tell us what we can do better to build on it. We, um, we're very honored that so far, the OpenNY program has been praised pretty widely. The Center for Data Innovation did a comprehensive analysis of all the programs across the state. And you'll see that New York State was in the highest bracket. We um, scored the, you know, the full possible eight points out of eight points, along with about five other states. So we're in a good position, but we know we can always do better. And it reflects not just our policies, which are extremely stringent, very thoughtful, constantly being developed, but our portal and our accessibility and data visualization tools. And of course, we know that we want to make this data come to life. So the data lens view, that's one piece. What's really exciting, though, is when we see third parties and we see app developers taking our data, running with it, and making incredible applications that improve life for New Yorkers. The MTA AppQuest is, is a great reflection of one of those opportunities. This, is, uh, this shows a few of the past winners that we've had in the contest. It's something we've done now many years in a row. And we've seen uh, just, phenomenal, oops, <laughs> just phenomenal apps come out of it that focus on everything from, um, from uh, uh, support for the visually impaired, uh, what to do if you fall asleep on the subway. It'll wake you up with an alarm so that you don't miss your stop. Um, really, you know, oh, another one related, a lot of related to sleeping in or falling asleep, um, what it will sync up with your alarm clock so that you wake up at ex with exactly enough time to get to the train because we have the real time um, alerts and real time data streams for the subway. So these are great examples and they, they win prize money. Some of them have gone on to become viable businesses in their own right. This is a great example that shows you know, we're not just doing it for accountability and transparency, we're doing it to improve service delivery and to create business opportunities for the, for the uh, tech sector. So that's the data piece, and then we move into service. So hopefully if we, we have that infrastructure in place, we have people educated and digitally literate, and they're able to take advantage of these tools, we have the data unlocked, so we've shared those building blocks for people to work with us in a collaborative way, <laughs> Now we're really able to dig into service and make sure that we can better serve New Yorkers through every digital touch point that could possibly connect them. So just to give an example of our first big milestone, um, and this was when, uh, when Governor Cuomo first came up with the idea to have a chief digital officer for New York State, and we were the only and the first state to have a chief digital officer, his number one goal was to put people first in everything we do digitally, not force people to go to eight different websites when they need eight different things. We should really come to where they live online. And 
we see what happens in the private sector. We see how seamless the transactions can be and how intuitive. Why isn't that happening in government? So that was our first task, and that's what my team and I had been focused on since, since our office launch in 2013. So this is a look of ny.gov. Any, does anyone recognize this website from the audience? I'm curious about if anyone. OK, so not a lot of people were using this website <laughs> before we started. This was New York State's official website. As you can tell, it, um, it had not been updated since 1999 in terms of look and feel. And if you think about all the things that had not been invented, so I guess I think Google was one year old, but one year old. Um, there were no iPhones. There was no Facebook. There was no Twitter. There was no YouTube. So the world has changed a lot. And while the website did remarkably well, given the amount of time that had passed since it, it first launched, nearly 15 years, uh, we knew that it was time for an upgrade. On, on the back end, in terms of our own process, we couldn't update this website without help from an engineer or technical staff. It was hard-coded. There was no content uh, management system. Search was broken. You could not use it on a mobile phone. It just appeared really tiny on your phone. You just had to keep <laughs> pinching and zooming. It was full of dead links because there was a lack of uh, clarity around ownership. And it was organized around our bureaucracy, not citizen needs. And it really sent this message of being out of touch, um, out of date, and out of order. Now, this is what you'll find on ny.gov if you arrive there now. What's great is it's fully responsive, so it fits any screen seamlessly. You can pull it up now if you want, on your, whether it's your, your mobile phone um, or your tablet. Um, if you pull it up now, we probably also will detect where you are and instantly give you local information that's relevant to you. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. This, is, this shows Albany, but if you're to bring it up in New York City, you're, you, you should see New York City or whatever borough you happen to be in. It has a very powerful search. It actually uses the Google Search Appliance. And we have predictive search as well. So now you can find what you're looking for if we haven't presented it quickly. We created a whole new service section. The city of New York has this great uh, 311. Um, and when I, when I was at the city, that was a big part of our strategy. At the state, we did not yet have a consolidated customer service section. So we created one. It's called Services. And we'll look at it in a moment. Um, as I mentioned, we have the local section, the powerful images. Those are also seasonal images that are based on the county you're in so that government feels relevant to you. This was one of our biggest challenges, is how do you create a home page that feels personal and relevant to every single New Yorker when people's experience of New York is so different depending on if you live upstate, downstate, do you live next to a beach, do you live in, a, in the mountains, rural, urban? There's a lot of different components. Well, location was our, our way to get there. It's also very easy for us to update um, using the Drupal content management system, which we're very excited about. We no longer have all kinds of windows popping up when we're embedding live video. And we have a very simple navigation that's based on intuitive terms. We did research with our users to find out how they describe their problem, not how we wanted them to describe their problem and that or, or their interest. And that became our guiding principle for how we moved forward. This is a quick look at our customer service pages. This is probably what you'll see on a tablet. And of course, again, it works on whether it's a mobile device or a desktop. We almost borrowed a page from the TurboTax type of philosophy of making it super simple to scan the page to find what you're looking for. We always have the same format, the same look and feel, so you don't feel like you're jumping around a million places. And we have a strict governance pro process, so we make sure that it's always up to date. So user-centric design is at the core of everything we do. What it really does is reflect Governor Cuomo's focus on people first. And it means that we re redesign every process and everything that we do as government to put the user at the center. Not government, not the media, the end user who is trying to get services from New York State. In terms of our priorities, we always <coughs> focus on the priorities of our users first. It's pretty straightforward, but when you look at the fact that, for example, many government websites may have started as another place to post press releases, or they were started as a place to serve other internal users, the first step we need to put ourselves in terms of changing our mindset is focus on that end user. So number one, anticipate the needs of the user, information hierarchy. And of course, the way that we solve this is through data, which I'll get into in a moment. We have an enormous amount of data through our analytics, and this is what guides us in the way that we develop every page that we have on our website. It's the way that we developed our navigation. It's the way that we're constantly tweaking what we have out there to get both qualitative and quantitative feedback, because we realize that if you listen to your users, they will tell you everything that you need to know. And so we're listening, and we're there to respond. 
Beyond that, if we haven't successfully anticipated your needs, oh, and just so to go back one step, in terms of anticipating, quick question to the audience. If you were going to guess what the number one inquiry that we get from the public on the ny.gov website in terms of search or keywords or just driving people to our site, what do you think it would be? Any ideas? Any thoughts? Anyone brave? Sorry? Taxes are big, but they're only big at, like over three days of the year. You should, the spike is literally like that on our analytics around April 15th. I wish. No. Um, DM, I'd, so DMV is a, is a pretty good one. So it's not necessarily just DMV. All things transportation is a huge, huge driver because if you think about transportation, often government has a monopoly on controlling different types of transportation, whether it's public transit or the roads, whether things are closed, et cetera. Transportation is always a top inquiry. Any others? Tourism. Tourism. We wish. Well, we have our I love. <laughs> We have our iloveny.com site, and that's where I think all of our tourists are going. So, <laughs> there, yeah, traffic again with transportation. So the other one is jobs, and jobs is actually a huge driver. Whether people are looking for um, local jobs or they're looking for jobs within government, government is a big employer. So, so jobs and transportation are really two of our big ones. And if you go to our service page, you'll find them pretty clearly up there. Um, another one that I'll mention, starting a business, that's not one of our top ones, um, although it does get a ton of traffic, but what we use, uh, what, that's a great example of, before we did this process, we had about 20 competing links for how to start a business, and it could be very confusing. Where, where do I start when I want to start a business? Now we have a single page, very clearly. Of course, we also have better structured pages, so it comes up, you know, number one in our in search engine, based on our search engine optimization in Google, and it's really, it, it's really been very successful. So the third piece that we focus on in our design priorities is communication. And the reason that's before the transaction piece is because you can solve about 70% of inquiries, questions, complaints if you provide the right information to the public. And if you don't have to go through the more cost-intensive, uh, labor-intensive customer service transaction, that's cost savings for government and cost savings for taxpayers. This is something we learned from 311. So that number is based on 311, who learned that through customer service, through information, you can cut down on those requests significantly. Fourth is transactions. So how do we make sure that anytime you're exchanging any information with the public, whether it's giving them a permit or helping them uh, to pay a bill or, or something along those lines, let's make it as smooth and painless as possible. And finally, um, engage. We know that you don't just live on our websites. And so we have a very citizen-centric approach where we come to where you live online, and I'll talk in a moment about some of the social media platforms that we use to continue that engagement. In terms of how we achieve user-centric design, I'll again try to just focus on the data pieces, but what's really helped for, for us is focusing on the end user and always using our data. We look at how are they accessing us? What are the social media platforms that they're using? What is the media sources? What are the keywords they're, that they're using? What are the pages that have the highest bounce rates where they're leaving in droves because they didn't get their question answered? And what are the pages with the highest number of visits? Because that's what we really need to optimize to be more successful. A few other things that have been really helpful for us. In government, we serve everybody, so that means not just um, you know, defining a narrow demographic, but we serve everyone from the very young to the very elderly, from very digitally literate to people who may not have any access at home, different languages, different ability levels. We serve everyone. And it's really great design discipline because it forces us to be very thoughtful in the way that we approach all, all of our work. Don't be afraid to go outside for input. This is something we constantly do in forums like this or asking our users directly, what can we do to engage? and make sure your org chart is not your information architecture. So the way you organize yourselves as an organization is not going to be necessarily the most effective way to organize your information for the end public. And we enable many paths to answer a question because we know that people have different ways they want to ask a question, but we always only offer one answer. And finally, launch is the beginning, not the end. This is one that we really have to remind everyone. Launching a website doesn't mean you're done. It means you're just beginning. So here's another quick view just to give you a sense of data and how we're using it. So again, as I said before, just having the data out there is not enough. We need to put it front and center. We need to deeply integrate it into how we serve the public. So if you were to access the local section on ny.gov, and that section was so popular, we gave it its own page, ny.gov slash local. In Brooklyn, here's what you would see. And one thing I wanted to note is not all of these are New York State data sets. 
and data feeds, because actually many of them on this page, I think all of them are, are basically real time. And that's because we, we know that at, from my experience with the city and now at the state is saying, oh, that's not us, that's the city, or oh, that's not, you know, that's not the city, that's the state. Doesn't really matter to the, 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 the citizen or the, the public. You just want to have your question answered. You just want to find the information you're looking for. So we know that this is what matters to New Yorkers. So that's what we prioritize. Number one, you have real-time service updates of every subway line. We have links to job openings in your area. We have trash collection information. Do we, is that trash collection? Oh, no, it's alternate side parking, which is the number one request for New York City. Um, whether or not the public schools are closed, and we do have trash, trash collection there as well. Dobbs Ferry, this is my hometown, actually, so <laughs> picked randomly, but to give another sense of the other types of thing you would, things you would find, this is further down away from the immediate needs, but you'll see information about huge infrastructure projects that could be happening in your backyard. Maybe you say, what's going on? I want to get a sense of that. For example, we have, uh, I think, five real-time uh, video feeds of the Tappan Zee Bridge. You can check it out right there. And things to do in your own backyard, whether it's uh, SUNY campus, uh, Path Through History, where you can, you can learn about historical sites, and I Love New York uh, parks and, and, and entertainment for you in your, in your area. And a beautiful view of, of the Palisades that reflects the actual area. So that's what we have so far, but the question is, has it actually worked? And again, this is where data is absolutely critical to us. So, so far it's looking pretty good. We relaunched ny.gov in November of last year, and our page views have quadrupled. So we are attracting more people to our website, and they're staying longer. And in some ways, we, we knew we had a, really a, a long way to go. We think that this is great. We want to see it go even higher. So we're going to constantly be tweaking and improving to make sure that we are serving New Yorkers in the way that they want to be served, in the way that's most effective and efficient. Our bounce rate is down and continues to drop. We want to see that continue to go even lower. It's already down by more than 20% year over year. And our visitors to NY.gov have more than doubled. So what's exciting about this is now we're reaching a whole new constituency. We're reaching people who were not coming to our website. So hopefully those of you who haven't been there will now start using it because it is more effective for you and it is going to help you. Mobile traffic has tripled. Um, and in terms of our social media, we've also seen a lot of growth there. So quick note on our social media, we now have an audience of over 5 million for the first time in history. And this is a breakdown of many different accounts. You'll see we have over 100 Twitter accounts across New York State government, um, more than 79 on Facebook, YouTube, um, which is not to say that we think that everyone should have a Facebook account or a Twitter account or a YouTube account or an Instagram account. Um, but we do see it as an opportunity for agencies to have a deeper, more direct relationship with their constituents. But we also track what's working when it comes to those relationships. So even though you saw before there were more Twitter accounts than Facebook, this is interesting. Oh, so yeah, you'll see that actually we've got a lot more um, fans on Facebook than on Twitter. So that's another place where data is really interesting to us. And then after that, we've got Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, Medium, Pinterest. OK, interesting. But that alone also doesn't tell the full story. So another piece that we're really careful about and, and aware of is where are we seeing our growth? So I guess another question to the audience, where would you think we saw most of our social media growth over the past year online? If you're going to pick a, a platform. Twitter. Sorry? Twitter. Not on Twitter. Instagram. No, no. YouTube. Instagram. Who said Instagram? Instagram. Instagram, I believe, was our sleeper hit, although we'll show you that um, it, we, tech, we had a, a, the appearance of increase on Tumblr because we had we went basically from, from zero, so the numbers were a little bit skewed. But where we really saw the, the biggest real growth um, was on Instagram um, in terms of our followers over the past year. So we find this really helpful because we see these huge numbers, but we also want to be going to where, you know, moving to where the puck is going and, and make sure that we're anticipating where our users are. So finally, data-driven industry. And just in terms of New York State as a whole, there are so many industries that are that are, whose growth and whose, um, whose vitality right now is really being supported by data. If you look just in New York City alone, uh, whether it's the tech sector, the tech sector and all of the new sectors that are being disrupted by digital technology, whether it's media, finance, real estate, fashion, data plays an incredibly important role in all of those industries, and I think we'll continue to see that. In New York State, we have a number of programs where we want to continue to support that growth. 
Um, we have Startup New York. We have a range of business incubators all across the state. Excelsior tax credits, venture capital funding, Global NY. If you want to see more of these, go to ny.gov business. We, again, are streamlining that process of starting a new business. So if you're looking for that information, you can find it quickly and at a glance. Uh, Startup in NY, if, if you're not familiar, pairs uh, innovative startups with local schools to help to create that symbiotic relationship with academia and, and the technology sector. And the companies that are a part of that program pay no state taxes for 10 years. That includes income taxes, personal income taxes for all employees. So it's a fantastic opportunity. And you're able to access that top college um, and university talent and connect with great infrastructure. So um, the, here are some of the, there's opportunities in every zone. And again, you can find this on ny.gov or on startupny.com. So we have an enormous amount going on. I'm not sure if we have time for questions. We have time for one question, one amazing question. Um, but thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for your time. And it's all thanks to you that so many exciting things are happening across New York State. And we're working here to serve you. <laughs> if you have a question, there's a uh, mic. Uh, if I could please ask you to go up to the mic, because apparently there are no past mics. I should have mentioned that. Sorry about that. Thank you very much for your presentation. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, my name is Jacqueline Spann. What I'd like to know is, in addition to what you're showing, uh, what is really critical is all of these emergencies in terms of trains, planes, and uh, flooding and everything, and it's school closings, all of this. Well, I, I really honestly believe we should have one website that will, you can go to right away and check, you know, if the what's happening with your train, what's happening with the schools, what's happening. Uh, have you considered that? I mean, that is really critical now. Yes. Uh, that's what I'd like to see. And I think that's a great question, and I 100% agree with you. So we do have, um, we do have that in the new ny.gov. Fortunately, we haven't had to roll it out yet because there has not been an emergency um, of that, of that uh, scale and caliber since I was here. But I, so I was, at, um, I was working for New York City for both um, the anticipated Hurricane Irene and Hurricane Sandy. And we found out that um, in, digital information was incredibly important. And we also had to completely rethink the way that we did it. Because in those situations, often there's no power or there's limited connectivity. And basically, all that people want to know is, again, closures, status, and above all, transportation whether it was high occupancy, high occupancy vehicle rules or subway status, et cetera. So what we have on the new NY.gov, and I don't have the slide today, but it exists, and it is ready to go. We, I believe we've created a couple of pages, um, but we haven't need to use it. And what it is is it's a website that's completely stripped down, so it will load very quickly on your phone, even if you have limited connectivity. It's only data, and it's, and it's giving you um, all these status updates, and we're able to update it very clearly. And all it shows you is, subway status, bridges, tunnels, what's closed, any high occupancy vehicle um, rules. Uh, so anything in those areas, power outages, school outages, and anything you might need to know. Um, so we, we're very focused on that. We also have the ability, if, if needed, to um, replace our homepage with that page. And we can put a banner across the top of every single website in the ny.gov ecosystem, which is millions of pages and direct everyone you know, to, to, that, to that emergency page. So I completely agree. Um, I also actually want to shout out that when at the city and now at the state, we're talking with, the, with them again, the Google Crisis Response Group has been great, great partners. Because not only do we streamline our own information, but if you have a partner like Google, especially Google Crisis Response Team, what we did during Sandy was we worked with them to share data because they created this, and it, where they maintain the Google crisis response map, which is always going, um, but they can create different layers to provide things like shelters. We wanted to give shelters for people who had to evacuate. Where could they go? And Google had that link right below their search box on their homepage, which is the best real estate you could possibly ever hope for if you're trying to serve people. So um, it's a great point. We want to constantly be improving. We hope we never have to use it, but we're ready when the time is. So thank you again. This will be a great event. I'm so happy to be here, and thanks for having me. All righty. So we're going to have the first panel come up. The speakers can all join me on stage.
Good to see you. Yeah, just pick a chair where you shove when you want. Good to see you, Lucas. Oh, yeah. Hey, Ben. Before getting situated, how about another round of applause for Rachel? That was awesome stuff. Alrighty, so I want to uh, kick off and get started. I know we're um, tight on time today. So um, thank you so much for all the panelists for joining me today on our first panel of the day. Um, why don't we just start off by doing quick intros? You can introduce yourself to the audience, and we'll just run down the list, uh, run down the uh, list, and, and start with Allah on the end. Okay, my name is Allah Work in the He's talking to you My name bit. is Arla Reddy. Work in uh, tr for Transit System Data Research. I've been with the Transit for more than 30 years. Right after college, I started in Transit, and you know, started with the data, and then you know, all over the places, many departments I worked, and I learned a lot about uh, system, and you know, understand the user needs, like operations, all that, and I was all over the places in materials, in shops, yards, in buses, everywhere, you know. But my passion, basically, data. You know, from the beginning, I've been using the data. In those days, everything paper-driven and all that. I understand the difficulties taking advantage of that data, not enough, and it's very expensive to take into consideration. Recently, since all this open source and everything, basically, it's helping. But it's a big data. It's not easy to convert that in a report format and uh, make it useful to all users. You know, we have so many types of users, like operations, Upper management, middle management, everybody wants different, different things. Since we know the business, we understand the uh, transportation, we kind of automate a lot of information, trying to experiment and test it and make it useful to everybody and try to run the system much better. That's what you know, I mean. Hello, I'm Lucas Finko. I work at Con Edison in the Energy Efficiency and Demand Management Department. Uh, me and my team, we are kind of the tip of the spear trying to drive what we can learn from data in our system to drive energy efficiency and uh, help manage our load better on uh, reduce cost for all New Yorkers on their electric bill. Uh, I've been at Con Ed for about eight years now. Uh, had some tough assignments during Sandy uh, and the lockout, uh, which were fun though. Um, and my background is, is in physics. I studied physics for many years. Uh, also at uh, SUNY Stony Brook. <laughs> A uh, big fan of, of SUNY universities, so that's me. I'm uh, Ben Wellington. Uh, I, I run a blog called iQuantNY, uh, or Quantify. It was basically an experiment I started uh, about a year and a half ago to see if I took all this open data that we just heard about, um, how could I, as a citizen on the outside, drive change within New York City policy? So I spent the last year and a half um, experimenting with that and getting the city to change some things by just doing data science on open data. Um, I have a background in computer science, uh, and uh, I'm also a visiting assistant professor at the Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. Hello, my name is Mary Ann Schretzman. I work with the city of New York. I work in health and human services. We created a center called CIDI, which is, which is the Center for Innovation Through Data Intelligence. And we focus specifically on health and human service data so that we can improve the lives of all New Yorkers. Great. Thank you very much. Alrighty. So first question for the panel, and, and feel free to jump in um, whoever would like to start. Um, how are your organizations using data to improve the way that New York City runs? And then what types of specific data points, metrics, are you looking at um, in order to quantify the impact that you're having? I, yeah, I, I can, I'll start with uh, a few examples, I guess. Um, so I'm not, since I'm not an organization, it's a little different for me. I'm right. just, I'm just a guy. Hi. Um, <laughs> but I measure, I measure uh, some of the impact by by watching changes in the city. So I'll give, I'll give two examples. Um, one was I did some analysis showing that in New York City cabs, when you hit that 20% tip button, you were tipping on two different amounts depending on the vendor in the back of your cab. It was either on tolls and taxes or not on tolls and taxes. And so with open data, you can suddenly investigate this. And this has been the case for about a decade. When I wrote about that, the TLC worked with the vendors to reprogram half the cabs in New York to bring them in line so that you didn't have to worry about the computer system in the back of the cab. Um, another example, I found the fire hydrant in New York that was generating the most parking ticket revenue. 
Um, these two hydrants were, were generating over $55,000 a year just being hydrants, so more than minimum wage, just being hydrants. Um, and they came to light just by analyzing parking tickets. Uh, why? Because they'd been that way for about eight years, um, and it turned out there was some mismarked, uh, uh, it wasn't very clearly marked, the DOT, the Department of Transportation disagreed with the NYPD on whether it was legal to park there. Uh, after I wrote about that, the city came and repainted the streets. And so we're starting to see open data. I, I consider that kind of an impact when I see an actual action, a response. Um, maybe they're small, but I'm seeing, starting to see movement from, from open data, so. That's very cool. As we all know, public transportation is critical. <laughs> As public transportation is critical to the way New York City runs. New York City using the publicly available open source big data Everybody knows that bus time, we have the next stop, all that. And uh, GTFSRT, that is the one subway countdown clock. People are all familiar with that. We are taking advantage of that open source data and trying to convert in a report format and trying to assist both public and you know, our own customers, like in operations. You know. So uh, what is, what's the purpose of that? Basically, we can able to have better service, like improve improve the scheduling process, and a better incident management strategies, so that it was lacking in the past. Now we have information. We need to make sure everybody understand there are tools there. You can able to improve the service, you know. And you just hold it a little closer to your mouth. So more efficient train and bus dispatching. Right now, the way we have the world system, we didn't have all these tools. Now we are taking advantage of the information. Since it's a big data, it's not easy to convince all operations. It's a very complex thing. Make them to understand and make them available, which is a kind of the one we are working right now. Okay, so I, I hope many of you understand that the electric industry is going through a major, major shift right now, a major paradigm shift. Uh, in the past, it was demand grew, and so we invested in more wires uh, and transformers. And that, that paradigm isn't going to last very long. It's, it's got its due by date. And the new paradigm is, instead of just building, we should find ways to increase efficiency on the system, find ways to distribute the generation so that it's more resilient, uh, say when you have a Sandy, and uh, more renewable and better for our planet, like say wind or solar uh, that doesn't emit carbon and other pollutants. So. That's one of the things that, that we focus on in our group. Uh, we're trying to identify these alternative solutions. Uh, one example is right now we, we had planned to build a new substation on the border of Brooklyn and Queens. Um, and so instead of send, spending $1.2 billion uh, that would go into your bills, we searched for a different way to do it uh, with energy efficiency, with distributed generation, um, with like some kind of load shifting demand response type strategies. Uh, and so our group uh, developed this, this program. And so we look at a lot of customer data. We're trying to identify uh, who, who are the customers that we need to be targeting for this. Uh, what do we want them to do? Do we want them to buy batteries or do energy efficiency? Uh, more efficient lighting is one very easy, inexpensive thing you can do, which is way, way cheaper than building a new substation. And so if we can do these kind of things instead of just the old way of building, um, we can lower your bill and improve your service, uh, which is kind of the, one of the biggest goals uh, we're looking for with that. Yeah, and I think it's very similar to what we were doing in health and human services, where uh, often our organizations are set up to match a specific need so that when you come to an organization like the Human Resource Administration or Child Welfare, we're only providing specifically the same thing to everyone who comes to our door. And now we're looking to target the services so that folks who need a certain service get that service and not everybody's getting the same size fits all type of services so that we're more efficient and, we're more, and we meet more of the needs of the people who uh, have need of the service. So we're trying to, what we say, get out of our silos so that it's not just a child welfare problem or not just a homeless problem or a public assistance problem, but it's a problem that's affecting one human being, one family, so that we can have a holistic approach to that family. And it doesn't matter what door they come into uh, through the city service that we will 
provide the service that they need without having to be referred and go around the city for all of these kinds of services. Right. And that's some of the challenges that we are trying to overcome. That's great. Sort of this focus on the user mentality that Rachel was just speaking about. Exactly. Um, great. So next question I have is, um, how is data producing tangible benefits for the average New York City uh, resident? Right, so I think you know Ben's example certainly can speak to that. Um, do you guys have specific examples you can point to um, that you know will make people in the audience go, "Oh yeah, that's that's cool. Like I appreciate that. I, I see how that um, is improving my life." What have you guys seen there? Any specific examples that jump out? Well, for us, we're looking at senior centers, and we're looking at how how do we uh, seniors have to? They don't have to, but they go to a lot of the senior centers and. By doing so, uh, they participate in lots of activities. And how do we enhance those activities for well-being and have a sense of, again, a holistic approach? And to make sure that access to benefits are there at the senior centers so they don't have to go other places. And we're doing experiments right now to really help access services. Because sometimes Medicaid, when you become 62, you're either uh, filling out Medicare film forms, which are quite at times easy, but quite overwhelming at other times. So there's lots of services that are just not, quote, senior specific, but for the general well-being of your health and accessing services. And what is the right, what are the, what's the, what we call often the nudge project that works? Is there, using behavioral economics, is there something that you can opt in or opt out that's easier for you uh, than something else, and how do we make the environment so that you can easily choose the right decision, and you don't have to, you know, meditate for ten hours, go to ten some kind of psychiatrist hours, and to get motivation. That it's simple, it's easy, and anyone can do it, and it doesn't require that much effort. So that's some of the work that we're trying to undertake um, to make it easy. Uh, for people to do things that are helpful for their well-being. I can talk about this performance. As we all know about, we monitor the performance in your city. You have to provide a better service, you know. But the information was not available in the past. Now, based on this countdown clocks and uh, AVL data from buses, recently we advanced in technology and taking all that data and converting and reporting to the board also using this information. Before we report to the board, we need to build some tools for operations because in the past, they used to get it like once in three months, four months like that. Now, the information is available. But in order to quantify good information, whatever you report AVL data, it's not 100% complete because there are issues with the AVL technology, there are issues with the maybe some kind of technical issues, all kinds of things, you know, we need to integrate that information. It's not complete, but in transit, we are integrating with multiple sources of data. Of course, there are so many legacy systems there, but we need to pull the data together, however, and make it, this data available to operations so that they can take advantage of this information and improve the service. It's working, but still we are learning, and it's not that simple to make everybody understand so much information from nothing to so much. Okay. In the past, everything was expensive data. Now the data is not expensive, it's available, but how we convert that? So making them aware, generates, create some kind of user tools, simple tools, each level of management is different, operations is different, like dispatchers, they, they need to address like bus bunching, like trains, all that, so many things going on. We are learning, and we are taking advantage of this, and we are spreading out this information, and we are reporting to them. And we are confident in New York City, using this data, we are so advanced. In a matter of few years, we moved up to the level we are using the data. In other properties, they have this information going back last 10 years, but they couldn't be able to convert in a format the way we report. You know, we have a lot of indicators. You know. That's what we are doing, trying to improve the service. That's our main goal. You know. So I already mentioned kind of the substation one, so I'll do a different one. Could I see a show of hands real quick? Who has Con Edison service in the audience? Can I see who has no choice? No, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, they don't have a choice. 
And can I also see who has participated in an energy efficiency program at Con Edison? Oh, we do have some. Very good. So over 190,000 of our customers have participated in energy efficiency programs. And it's our pledge to shoulder some of the cost with you and help give you the tools uh, to become more energy efficient. Um, and these programs, I believe, have been wildly successful. We've reduced a lot of carbon in our state and in our city here, too, because we do generate uh, in the city for security purposes. Um, one of the things our group uses data for is to try and target the right customers with the right message. So we do not want to send somebody who owns a room AC a central AC rebate, right? So a uh, rebate form. So we do spend some time uh, picking through the data that we have, our bills. Um, our billing information is, is becoming better and better all the time with our uh, automated metering infrastructure. Uh, curiously enough, in New York State, we don't have interval meters. We don't have detailed data uh, on your electricity use. Um, and this is something we're pushing right now in, f in front of the regulator. So if you wanted to do something today to improve uh, data in, in New York State, you can call the regulator and say, I want automated metering infrastructure in New York, because um, I know I want it. I always check my meter at like 8 AM. I don't know what they're thinking. Yeah, no. <laughs> Once a month, too, right? <laughs> so, um, and so we use that, and we data mine that. We also use the Pluto Buildings Database, which I love. I pour over all the time. We use it for everything. Um, they made it free recently, so you can go and download it right now. Uh, it gives you a lot of information on buildings, how old they are, how big they are. Um, we love that. We, we use very little kind of uh, intrusive information. And uh, that's really all you need, right, to sufficiently target people. And I'll add, as far as impact, I, I gave a few uh, examples earlier. I think we're really early in citizen impact and open data. Part of that is because the data is not quite there yet. We're, we see a lot going on, but we have a lot of agencies that are still very reluctant. Um, uh, in New York, the police department, we're still waiting on crime. We don't see anything on New York City Housing Authority coming out. We don't see our Economic Development Corporation in New York putting out any data. Um, and we also have a big focus on app competitions. We heard uh, Rachel earlier talk about app competitions. New York City does app competitions, but we haven't seen much in data science competitions. So until we kind of drive that from the city and state level, I think we're really early on in, a, in citizen data innovation. Um, even though we're, we're building apps, we're not necessarily analyzing it quite yet. So I, I look forward to the next few years. I think, too, our sense of mapping where people are experiencing different issues, for example, where kids are coming in from forced to foster care, where homeless families are coming from, we can all map that out in the city, and we are able to now target and identify these communities that have these issues and what we can do from a prevention to understand that. We've also done some probabilities, and many people think that if you were in foster care, you're life chances are going to be impacted in a negative way. And that's not always the case. Um, in fact, kids who come into foster care later in life have more chances of becoming involved in juvenile justice. Not all foster care kids. And it's a very small group of y youth who become involved in juvenile justice. And we know more now today than we ever did before so that we could help these families and really serve them in a different way than we've ordinarily served families. And this is a great thing for the city to know this so that we could help these youth at a very early age. And that's something that CIDI has been able to work with the agencies. We work in teams. We really believe that we are not the, we're, we help with the knowledge of using the data but the data is people in our world. So we're very sensitive to looking at the data, what's happening with the data, understanding the complex, the social context of where the data is coming from, and also the individual complexity of what goes on with the data. And for us, there has been a lot of work around language and understanding so that we have a common language when we speak about the data. Just, I can give you a million examples where we have great analysts coming in and data scientists coming in and saying, oh, let's do this, and they don't really capture the understanding because it's so nuanced in these worlds. 
of uh, difference between an applicant and an applications. Like, who, doesn't it all sound the same? Well, in human services, it's not. <laughs> and somebody leaving foster care as an adolescent as opposed to somebody who is an, uh, what they call an independent living kid. So it's like, really? I thought they were all the same. So there are all of these nuances that people have devoted their lives over uh, many, many years that have developed a profession that you have to tap and know how to glean that knowledge to use the data f for knowledge development and then be wise and compassionate about it. And that is our challenge. Our challenge for many, I'm getting into the challenges, but we've added a lot to the discourse in health and human services, but there's also been the challenge of getting the right question and that has often been very difficult for us. Uh, are we really asking the right question here? What, how do we drill down to make sure that this question is going to be helpful to the people we serve? And is it going to be actionable? Or is it just going to further stigmatize them and, and not have a response that's useful? So these are pieces of our work that we're constantly having to work in teams and figure it out and marry, if you will, the social work with the scientists. It reminds me, um, out on the West Coast, there's a nonprofit called Bayes Impact. Yeah, and, I, and, <laughs> and they're doing some really interesting work on um, recidivism rates. And what they want, their goal is to quantify the odds of recidivism based on the length of the sentence, and then put it in front of the judge during sentencing, so that the judge has just one piece of data that says, OK, you know, the longer you put them in, this is, this is the impact. Now this is going to be a very tricky thing because the judge is not going to be thrilled by this. But uh, <laughs> but that being said, it's an it's an innovative idea and and where you can start to see some of the uh, delicacies of data interpretation going through a human and then making a final decision. I, I love that project's very cool and reminds me of, of some of the work you're yeah, doing. Yeah, he's going to have to be very careful because the last guy who said that the criminal justice programs didn't work meant to reduce or reduce uh, sentences. He he was showing that they didn't work and in fact that became that services don't work. And yeah, yeah, that yeah. happened in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. So these kinds of interpretations, though, become, th that was the headline. And the researcher freaked out. That's not what he was intending to do. He was <laughs> intending to get these people out of prison. And it backfired and said, yeah, these services don't work. So uh, you have to be careful with all of these things. Headlines. Yeah, that's interesting. So why don't we stay on that theme a bit? Um, we've heard from you guys about some of the cool, interesting uh, benefits that are coming from the work that you and your teams are doing. Um, but why don't we stay on the topic of roadblocks? So what um, what obstacles do you encounter in your day-to-day -day work? And you know, what is the, the biggest um, roadblock for putting data to use for your organization, for your work? Okay, can I talk? There are several roadblocks. Not there are several roadblocks, can you hear, <laughs> that make analyzing the data difficult in the New York City environment. These include proprietary technology, and we have a lot of you know, those kind of things, privacy concerns, and information overload. So much going on. The pace of technology change has grown to a point that it is extremely difficult to keep up with and capitalize the information provided. The pace of change, coupled with the volume of data available, has strained the technology resources currently available, making it challenging to analyze and provide actionable results to the operations on a real-time basis. New York City has several onboard diagnostic systems installed on buses and subway cars that could provide wealth of data, but the data is not well documented because it's developed by different uh, proprietary agencies. I mean, proper volume of data would quickly overhang the current infrastructure. One area of success in overcoming these barriers has been in the area of real-time data analytics for the Department of Buses. New York City now provides real-time diagnostic data utilizing the multiple data sources, which still maintaining the privacy and integrity of the source of the data. So that's what we are doing right now. So I would say one of our biggest challenges is uh, behavior, right? So much of energy use is about how our customers behave and how they use that energy, and they have many choices. And so, um, getting getting enough information for the customer uh, is a challenge that we have, because we we need uh, more detailed metering, which I hope the uh, regulator will approve soon. And then making that information understandable to the customer 
and telling that customer what they can do to change that outcome. Uh, and the main reason why that's important is because we, we build our system to meet the way you use energy. So if you don't like the way we build our system, the best thing you can do is start changing the way you use your energy. <laughs> um, and so one of the, you know, some of the smart grid and smart appliance things that you're gonna see coming out uh, in the next 10 years is trying to help us manage our energy use and our behavior. Um, you can see things like Opower is a vendor that specializes in uh, behavior change for energy applications. And so they're trying to use behavioral psychology to get people to look at their bill and think about their bill and, and how they can help, how their behavior can help enable a, a cleaner uh, energy grid. So that's, that, that's a real big challenge for us. I think in the, in the civic tech uh, world, and open data world, there, there are two main challenges. One is, one is culture. Um, and, and basically, you know, it's, it's scary to, to be to running an agency and, and have put data out and have people look and see inside and what's going on. And there's, so there's a, there's a fear and a, and a, and a you know, you have work to do. You don't have time to answer all these questions about that people are looking at all the data. And so culture is probably one of the biggest roadblocks. And we're seeing things moving in the right direction there. The other of all things are, are, are I hate to say it, but are PDFs. <laughs> um, uh, agencies, agencies love dumping PDFs uh, uh, as, as they meet their obligations to release data, but don't want people to use the data. Um, so we see a lot of that. And you see a good chunk of the civic tech community, people spending thousands of hours writing PDF parsers. These are, these are people who are passionate about government democracy, and they write PDF parsers all day. It's, it's heartbreaking to watch. Yeah. Um, but it is happening today uh, here, here in New York and, and, and around, around the country, around the world. Um, I was just in uh, 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 Taipei last week and uh, was doing a talk there on open data and brought up their police department uh, crime data and it was also all in PDF. And I said, all right, the New York and Taipei have something in common. Uh, um, so it's, it's, not, it's not a local issue, but that's probably one of the largest challenges that I'd love to see. You know, somebody click a little switch there and put it in a different format. That's an unexpected answer, PDFs. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't see that one coming. Yeah, I think from government for us, it's managing expectations. We have some commissioners who will think that, oh, you get this data analytics and you'll get this and this is going to solve the course of the human race problems. And <laughs> that, you know, the data and the analytical world is going to be the panacea and it's not. I mean, we're human beings and there's a lot of complexity. And so, and then there's others who, aren't that interested in the data and you have to really show them how to use the data that would make a difference in their agencies. So you you get sometimes the two real extremes of using the data and, oh, you know, they go on their gut and they want to do what they want to do. Yeah. And um, so, and sometimes for us, you know, we are, we live in the political world that priorities change and shift and we're just about to think it through something and then geez that's really not as important as it is over here so uh, the shifting of priorities and for us to the data itself the health and human service data is confidential mm -hmm. and so that requires a sensitivity that we uh, have to deal with on a constant basis sure. So my next question is a somewhat provocative one. Um, is New York City a smart city? I, I uh, expect that Rachel, if she's still around, may have um, a perspective on this. But um, do you think, in your, in your opinion, that uh, New York City is a smart city? And how do we compare to other leading cities throughout the country? How are we doing? Who wants to go first on the provocative <laughs> question? Don't all jump in at once. I'd say yes, and we have a very smart mayor. In all sincerity, we're, we're a smart city, we use data, we have very smart people in our city, and moreover, we have very compassionate people who want to see people do well, and that's the good news of our city. I think we have major challenges, and at the same time, uh, it just speaks to our infrastructure that was mentioned earlier. I mean, when you're, st I see some countries that are just starting out and they don't have to worry about these data uh, sets that were uh, data programming that was d done in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. I mean, we're we've still a building on the Wang machine and trying to get rid of some things because it's um, it's been there and we were an early user. So. Like a lot of things in New York, our infrastructure was built in the early 
when was it built? In the 60s, 70s? <laughs> you know, a lot of the, these buildings are really old. Yeah. Well, and yeah, yeah. we don't want to tear them down. We want to build upon these beautiful places. And, and that has been, I think, a big challenge. I was, I was just in a meeting uh, the other day, and somebody said, you know, when, when we benchmark our electric system, uh, we don't benchmark with Rochester or Syracuse. We benchmark with Hong Kong. Uh, because, you know, the city is so unique and it's so dense. And we have an underground electric system here, right? You've never seen any wires uh, above ground in New York City. So it's all underground. It's buried. Um, we're a very unique system. Um, we have higher reliability standards because so many things rely on power that uh, w would be very uncomfortable when we don't have power, like the subway and things like this. So. Um, I kind of see New York City as taking a, a strong leadership position uh, when I go to these city conferences. Um, I didn't I didn't see a lot of cities having you know a New York City open data site. I think that's fantastic. I think we do a great job there. Um, I think we're leading. I think we still have a long way to go. I think we're just starting on this journey. Um, and I think yeah, you know, we were talking before about all the legacy systems we have from the 70s mainframe. <laughs> you know. And that we spend so much time and energy just bringing the, the company into today. Um, so it's an exciting time, I would say. And I think we're doing a great job. I think uh, people, certainly cities around the world, are looking here to, to see what we're doing. Um, as I said, our, our, I think our open, our open data, as much as, as much as there are big holes, is still uh, ahead of, of so many other places. Um, and so in that regard, you know, we're being very forward looking there. It is, as was said, is early days. Um, there are things going on like, you know, crime stat and, and other data analysis packages going on. But but we're st we're seeing kind of still very um, early stuff there. And I think once once the reason I'm I'm sort of an advocate of opening some of this stuff up is because once it's out, government can learn from the innovation of, of all people of all uh, of, of all interested parties. And there's so much knowledge out there that when you when you release something, you get ideas back. We haven't quite embraced that, um, but that being said, we're doing innovative things, and we're 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 far ahead in that journey. Though it's still at the beginning of you know we're ahead of everyone else, but we're still at the beginning. I put it that way. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. I can. We produce, I think, more reports than anybody else, and we report to the public on a monthly basis. A lot of you know performance side, you know statistics, all that. We share a lot of information, but our infrastructure, 100-year-old system, subway system, very old. With all the difficulties we are facing, with all the signal system much older, we are still running the system in such a way, keeping the capacity of over 5 million people, 5.56 million subway riders, and on the bus side, over 2 million. But many properties, they have advantage. Ours is a much older system. Those properties built based on knowledge learned from New York City transit, you know, that's what the advantage they have. But we are up to date, we are trying to keep up the technology with all these problems we are facing and uh, running the service much more efficiently compared to years back. So that's a more challenging, you know, and we need to continue to do that. Gotcha. <clears throat> all right, this is the last question for me, and I'm gonna ask whoever has a question to line up. We have two mics, one there and one there, um, and you guys can fire away after this question. Um, so I'm gonna ask you guys to get out your crystal ball and um, think into the future three, five years down the road. Um, what do you see uh, as the most meaningful changes in terms of how New York City operates? Um, and where will data have the most dramatic impact? Um, so where do you see things heading? How is this city that we live in um, going to be really different than it is than what we see today? And um, again, where can data have the most dramatic impact? I think we're going to be able to identify problems faster. So we'll have more time to intervene with, with uh, young people, and that's a great thing. I, also, from a health and human service piece, and I think we'll be able to, by doing our mapping exercises in communities, that we'll be able to help people to develop apps like ZocDocs Zoc, Zoc Zoc mm -hmm. that are more in the health and human service arena that we could easily get appointments for people who right now it's a challenge to navigate that access. So I think those two pieces uh, in our world of health and human services will make a difference. I think in education, helping people to be lifelong learners and the use of videos uh, in languages and other kinds of uh, advanced thinking 
will make a big difference and not just go into for class time, that education will change so that you don't have to spend your time in high school just sitting there getting the time, and but that you'll actually have the competencies and move on by, based by your competencies. And I think that'll change the nature of high school. Cool. I think um, in the electricity industry, hopefully in the next five years, you're going to see a lot of change. Um, our regulators are pushing a new initiative they're calling REV. So they're trying to drive a more distributed uh, electrical system where people can generate power on their rooftops with solar or with wind, or you could have a fuel cell in your basement. Uh, you can have a battery in your, your driveway. And so Con Ed is going to start reaching out to you more with more data, with more ideas, with more things we want you to participate in. Right, if you live in uh, Crown Heights or Ridgewood or uh, Richmond Hill areas, we should be reaching out to you right now. Uh, we'd like to get you to conserve energy uh, to help us avoid this very large investment. You're going to see a lot more of that. Um, a survey recently showed that people think about energy, their energy use, for six minutes every year, uh, which is pretty crazy, right? So I, for one, want that to bump up because the electrical and the gas uh, use, that's, that's a large percentage of our energy consumption, and that drives you know, a lot of our, our carbon emissions in this country. So I want everybody to thinking more about their energy use and, and how they can conserve and how they can be more sustainable. Uh, so hopefully you'll see a lot more coming from us on that in the next five years. That's great. So just in recent years, we have changed a lot. Looking at the bus time app, people can see where the bus is and the countdown clock. That's just in a matter of a few years. But there is so much potential in three to five years. I think we can able to look into the information, what's going on on mobile devices and uh, our, uh, tablets through the cloud. You know, So the expectations will be that all data will be processed in real time. And service will be monitored, adjusted in real time. That's what the challenging thing. I think there is a potential that can be done. The most dramatic impact will be information. New York City will be able to provide to the customers. When the customers face disruption, try to identify and reroute them in a way which, which is the shortest way you know, to avoid all the problems and everything, you know, like bus routes, diversions like that, you know, always something there in the subway system, any kind of incident happen, what is the best alternative to, to go take other system? You know? That's what the future there, you know, that's what we need to improve in. I guess um, for transit, I see in five years, maybe we'll, we won't have annoying balances left over on our Metro cards. That would be, <laughs> <laughs> but um, that would be awesome. But then uh, in, in uh, uh, they're working on that. more, I know they're working on it. They added that, I got them to add a new button, 2725. If you go down there, if you hit that button, you get exactly 11 rides. That was after I fought them for a while. So there's now, yeah, there we go. We got four buttons now instead of three. It's a start, but anyway. Um, but, but more seriously, I think once data gets out there, uh, uh, we'll see things like uh, being able to predict, you know, better, better predict where fires are going to happen based on 301 data, you know. Uh, and I think early indications there say buildings with more uh, loud noise complaints tend to have a higher incidence of fires. Age of you know mapping with Pluto and and a lot of this stuff as we get out we'll start to see and and, and come up with innovative ideas of, of where the city can you know better make garbage route pickups and things like that. We're, once again we're very early there, but I think five years from now we'll see a lot of really cool optimizations that will be very direct to predict things that are going to happen uh, where needs are being and be able to deploy things better. So. All right, I think we have time for a couple questions. Um, why don't we start over there? If you can just uh, say your name and uh, which organization you're with, that'd be great. I'm um, Professor Adrian Wheeler from Baruch College, as well as the School of Professional Studies. I have uh, at least three of my students here with me today, so I had to say something. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is for the gentleman from Con Edison. And uh, you've been telling us about our own personal um, efficiency efforts. What are you doing with the corporations? Because it seems to me that they're the real offenders or you know, they're more extreme than we are. Can you tell us about some energy efficiency amongst the corporations? And then, then I, I'm a professor, right? Two questions. <laughs> so the other question is, um, which 
which employers are looking at the most data analysts to hire them? Where, where would the data, data analyst opportunities be amongst the three of you? Sorry, Iquant, but the three of you that are there. So I'll answer your second one quickly. I think everybody should be hiring data analysts, and I think a lot of businesses are catching on. So um, that's my quick answer. The first question, um, we do have energy efficiency programs for all customers, all types. Um, and many people assume that it's like almost like a wealth transfer mechanism that we collect from everybody and we give to the, the wealthy, you know, smart businesses. And actually when we looked at it, we found that it was the opposite. Mm -hmm. That these large companies were not taking advantage of our programs, um, which is odd because they have energy managers, they have building managers, you know. So we're actually innovating new programs to try and get them to be more active. Um, and a weird thing happens, weird things happen like uh, they want to do this project right now and they don't want to fill out our paperwork so they do it. Um, so it's complex. Uh, we do things like our new dropship program where if they want to do a big lighting project, um, they don't need to fill out a big program, paperwork and all this. We just ship them light bulbs and their O&M people install them. So it's very cost efficient. Uh, it costs us very little to get them to upgrade their lighting. Um, another one is called the uh, Self-Direct program, which we're going to pilot here next year. Uh, every one of us gets a SBC charge on our bill, and that goes to pay for our energy efficiency programs. And so these large customers are going to get that charge put into like uh, an HSA account, and it'll have a balance, and it'll say, look at all this money we've collected from you. You can use this to do projects. You shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't let this sit. You should use this money to get, be more efficient and and we find that um, when they're in, they're all in. They, they have professional people that manage it. They make sure it works, uh, and they do a great job. So we definitely want to encourage them some more. And on your data analyst, I actually work full time uh, for a financial company called Two Sigma as, as doing data analysis. So not just the blog. Um, <laughs> turns out that, you know, that, uh, yeah, as you said, across the world. So government's hiring. Uh, New York City Mayor's Office of Data Analytics is looking for people in data. So we've got everything down from the government to, uh, you know, advertising is really big right now, interested in data. Uh, most large companies, obviously your Googles, your Facebooks, your LinkedIn's are all really interested in data. Really, as you said, everybody. Those are some of the main main industries, sales. It's really just kind of applicable in so many different areas. So um, lots, lots of opportunity there. Yeah, I would say too, every city agency always had, had has had an analytical department. You, it comes under different names in each agency, but and that's been going on since the late 80s. And so whatever your subject matter expertise or interest, that city agency okay. typically needs data analysts. I mean, because they're those positions that people don't stay, they stay on average uh, two to five years, so there's, there is turnover. Uh, so almost any city agency has a policy department or analytical department. So I, and those jobs are always available. And exciting. Yeah, and they're great jobs, they are. We have teams, we work, everybody works in teams, at least in health and human services. I can't speak to the overall, but we work in teams, we have, uh, we really struggle with the questions, we struggle with getting the right data and making sure we're doing it right and that there's context, as I mentioned, and that what we're doing will be useful for humanity and for the people we're serving. And those are, and it's tough. It's, and there are great people who've committed their, their careers to these subjects that they become subject matter experts on. And the analytical people really learn from them. And it's a beautiful uh, cross uh, training, if you will, for an analyst to learn a, a particular subject. I think for the first time, it's cool to be a, a data geek. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I think everybody's trying to find them and hire them. Um, I think we have time for one more question. So whoever is ready over there, Can I'll uh, respond. I just oh, want, sorry, yeah, I just want to say something. Data analytics, I mean, we are, I think MTA.info there, we hire you know, a lot of analysts. Basically, they have background in math. You know, you need the quantitative skills. You know, that's what we look at. And one of the things, Hiring process takes much longer. The one innovative thing, what we did a couple of years back, we started a program, college aids, college internship. And that program helped a lot 
to convert all this streamline of information, putting it in a, like a visualization format and reporting to the things that they help a lot. So we have a lot of challenges and bringing new talent from outside. They understand the technology and we understand the business and mixing with that, helping a lot, you know. That's what I give them a lot of credit, you know. So. Great, thank you for the question. So we have time for one more and we're a little bit over time already. So yeah, hi, we'll Howard watch. Teach. I had, as I was listening, it was a great panel and, and what came up for me was accountability. So if we were looking at, uh, to voting for mayor in 2025, and your agencies and Con Ed is doing what it's doing and everybody's, what could we expect? If we said to you, and I, I guess it comes off of Allo with his citizens thing, if we said we expect that you can now decrease our cost by 10%, you can be 10% more efficient in everything, as you're talking about communities, that in terms of, of transportation, instead of putting in a new subway line, you could go to communities and you can make a diff difference by disruption of your plan by putting in more money now. How, how are you all talking to each other so we can have that benefit and know at that point in time that what you dreamed of now has sub sub substantive uh, answer for us in future years that you've made a difference? You know, you're raising a great question and issue. For us in human services, it goes like this. We, we evaluated a supportive housing project for youth. We compared uh, on a variety of agencies, which was beautiful, multiple city agencies, as to the impact of these youths on those services. It reduced jail time by 55 percent, homeless services by 33 percent. When you look at this supportive housing that we, it's very expensive. And people are really reluctant to understand those, that those costs as a public, and I'm not saying this administration, I'm saying as a public, to understand that supportive housing is really cost effective for, for youth, for certain youth and for people with mental health and substance abuse problems. But, to, but the investment on that is huge. And people are very reluctant uh, to put that kind of investment in the front end of it. So those are big challenges, at least in health and human services, as to what the investment cost is and the outcome. But over and over again, we must show those costs, and we do show those costs. But the investments often uh, far outweigh uh, what the savings are in the immediate. And the savings are over time. I think your question about accountability goes, is, is interesting. It, it applies to, I guess, all, all government, really, in some sense, and all government agencies and people who work with government agencies. So, so I would say that where, where data can come in is it can, give, it can shed some light, at least one dimension, on what's happening. And that way people can set you know, tangible goals. If, if, if we're saving money and reinvesting it in better train infrastructure, then we should expect less delays, and, and that should come out in the data. Um, and so, you know, some, somewhere behind each of these things, every once in a while, you could have a metric. Now, not, that doesn't mean everything has a metric, but, but that can help with some accountability. I, I promise you that by here, we'll say this, well, you can measure that. And so data can, can help with that. So I, for one, would stay glued to the Con Edison press releases. I would read them. <laughs> you will find out all the things that you want to know. I don't know why they're not top news. I mean, maybe we should I don't know, get maybe. Kim Kardashian to read them or something. <laughs> Um, obviously, everything we do is, is reported with the regulator, and, and you really can look at anything you want to know about Con Edison. Our, our books are open, our plans are open, everything is open in the rate case. Um, whereas Rachel, we'll get her back into here to explain the DPS website. Um, it, it is a little challenging at times. I mean, the case is over a thousand pages. It's uh, five boxes of pages. Um, and also, our energy efficiency efforts are listed on uh, the DPS website. Also, quite a few clicks to get to, um, which is an area of improvement. Um, oh, I just forgot what I was going to say. So, you know, everything you need is, is available somehow, but we should uh, continue to try and improve, like, say, the state's websites and make sure that uh, what we're trying to get through, what we're trying to get to, uh, not just the numbers, but the, the goal is, is there. Great. Let me also say, 
that Mindy Tallo at the mayor's office has created a management report that's not only based on specific city agencies, but on themes. So you can see transportation, the agencies that are going on for the transportation, what's happening. And they're tracking progress pretty carefully and reporting on that on, yeah. on a half semi-year basis. So you might want to check that out as well. And I think that's an accountability tool that's very important. Great. We have internally a lot of accountability, and we kind of compete like what we are going through the bus time app, and you know the data is available to everybody internally. We report and we monitor the performance, how everybody doing, like you know each borough manager level to the dispatcher level. We can able to track it. The information flow is helping a lot, you know, and as a result, we are trying to improve the service, you know. And that is all over the places. We have a lot of controls. We have a lot of standards and performance indicators internally to manage the service, all that. So now I remember what I was going to say. Um, can I do another poll real quick? How many of you have heard of 15 by 15? Do you know what that is? Wow. The size of most New York yeah, apartments. <laughs> <laughs> So in, in 2008 or 2007, the state set a goal. They wanted to reduce energy use by 15% by, by 2015. It's so weird that we're here now. It is 2015. It's not. Um, so I invite all of you to you know, stay informed in what these goals are and keep, keep and track it, of. Uh, did, it, did it work? Did we well, I invite all of you to go on Google <laughs> and find out and tell your representative that uh, you're happy or you're not happy with uh, what happened. Great. All right. Well, please join me in welcoming our panel. Thank you, guys. All righty. So we're going to swap to our number two panel. So if those panelists can join me on stage, please. You guys can just leave the mics there. Great. Thank you. Hey, how are you? Guys, uh, yes, we do need one more chair. We're gonna. Yeah, do you mind how we sit? Uh, no, pick wherever you want. Need one more chair. We're getting an extra chair. Don't worry. How are ya? You want to just add line over here? Yeah. Cool. All righty. All right. So let's go ahead and jump into our second panel of the day, Data for Small Business and Startups. Um, another all-star cast of panels with me on stage. Uh, I'm really excited to get started. So why don't we just do the same thing, start off with intros and run down the line real quick uh, to introduce, your, introduce yourself to the audience. Sure. Um. Hi. Um, I'm Lauren Hobbs. I'm the Director of Marketing for Union Square Hospitality Group. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, it's Danny Meyer's family of businesses, so uh, about 13 fine dining restaurants throughout the city as well as a consulting business and a large um, catering and venue hospitality business. Um, been there for about two and a half years and I'm also the co-founder of a hospitality tech conference called Tech Table that just took place. Hmm. And um, how data plays? Uh, yeah, just how, you know, how your role intersects with data, yeah. how you work with data. Um, so my role um, as director of marketing is, on the one hand, uh, everything to do with brand and brand experience, and then on the other hand, everything to do with guest experience, and that's really where, where data plays. Um, so thinking through how to deliver our operators throughout our businesses information about our guests and um, better their experiences throughout a variety of very high-touch businesses. And Lauren is a fellow Duke alum, so go Blue Devils. <laughs> <laughs> I'd throw that in there. Hey there. Uh, I'm Ben Kessler. I'm the director of marketing at WeWork, a company that I've been at for 
three years now. The company is about five and a half years old, uh, based here in New York. And uh, if you aren't familiar with WeWork, uh, we kind of build and, and develop space, community, and services for all types of businesses, startups, small businesses, freelancers, creatives, et cetera. Um, and my role at the company is, is kind of a lot of, I'm doing a lot of things right now, but um, wholly focused on all the product development, uh, product marketing for new features for our, our members kind of across the world, as well as uh, you know, the side of developing uh, the WeWork brand around the world, and, and also on the kind of new member acquisition and awareness side. So really excited to be here. Um, I don't think WeWork's really had a chance to tell uh, the story of, of how we're kind of building technology and, and data and, and using data. So there's a lot of cool things to talk about today. Hi, um, I'm Sam Pucci. I'm a senior software engineer at Next Big Sound. Uh, for those of you who do not know Next Big Sound, it is very specifically a data company um, that was actually just acquired by Pandora in July. Um, we're an analytics dashboard for the music industry. So basically what that means is if you're a musician or if you're a music maker in any way, so someone who works with musicians, and you want to see how you're doing on Facebook, how you're doing on Twitter, how you're doing on Google Analytics, really Facebook Insights, uh, Spotify, Pandora even, uh, Looking up that data would normally have entailed going to each site individually and trying to figure out really what your metrics are all about. And so what Next Big Sound brings to the table is a single dashboard to do all of that. Um, so yeah, very specifically, a data company. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Aileen Gemma Smith, and I'm the CEO and founder of Visualytics Technology. The mission of our company is enabling change with data, and we're powered by open government data. You might have heard of some of our work last week. Um, we entered into a public-private partnership with the Mayor's Office of Innovation and Technology, and we unveiled last week Neighborhoods.NYC. Neighborhoods.NYC is a dynamic website. It's available on web and mobile, and it's for every single New Yorker to understand what's going on in their neighborhood. It's available in 13 different languages, and you can figure out everything from events that are going on to see what 311 complaints are and more. It also services city services. So if, for example, you're a Spanish-speaking mom and you didn't know that there's actually a 311 app, it's actually there embedded in. The reason that the city came to us for that project was for, because of another product that we have. It's something called Mind My Business. Mind My Business serves well over a thousand businesses throughout all five boroughs of New York City. And basically what we do is make open data useful for the local shopkeeper, whether you have a diner or a bodega, local bar. What we do is give you targeted information about everything that's happening outside and around your shop that makes a difference to your bottom lines. We help shopkeepers save money, avoid risk for that, and really give them a heads up. And because folks like using it so much, we're actually rolling out into other cities. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Ori Klein. I lead um, analytics, data science, and finance for a company called Via. Um, if folks here have not heard about Via, we offer a ride-sharing service here in New York. Uh, we operate in Manhattan, below 110th Street, and we offer rides for just $5 anywhere in that area. And the way we do it is we use data and kind of real-time optimization to make sure we aggregate multiple passengers into vehicles that are going to the same direction. And um, as my role as, uh, as director of analytics and data science in VIA, I, I make sure that we use data and analysis to empower the business and to be as data-driven as we can in every decision and process that we have. Great. Um, one interesting thing that I just want to note for the audience, so uh, we reached out to all these companies because we knew that you know, they're doing really interesting, cool things with data. What we didn't expect is that we get people from, you know, with such different backgrounds. You know, we have folks who work in marketing and work with data. We have um, you know, software engineers who work with data. Um, you know, we have founders. We have all different types of people who are really in the weeds on a day-to-day -day basis and using data to drive decision making. So I thought that was just an interesting, uh, interesting outcome. Alrighty, so let's jump into the questions. Um, first question for you guys is, uh, what type of role does data play in your business model, and how is your company uh, using data to create a competitive advantage? So if anyone wants to, to start, feel free. So maybe I can start. Um, so, so as I've, I've mentioned, we, we offered shared rides in New York, and our core business model is based on the fact that we can use data and real-time optimization to make sure that we're as efficient as possible in aggregating multiple passengers into rides. And so we can pass all those savings by sharing those rides to customers and offer um, very low cost service. So this is, this is basically what, what our um, 
company was was um, founded on, and this is what we invest all of our time to to develop and build here in New York. So if I may, um, part of what we do, obviously, our whole business model is, hey, here's here's open data. Let's make it useful. And that's actually very attractive to a lot of folks in the enterprise, because picking back on something that Rachel said earlier, just because you build it doesn't mean they'll come. Um, because open data portals are great, and it's amazing that there are thousands and thousands of sets out there. But they're difficult and hard to use. And then when you want to look across them, instead of just visualizing down in one set, that's wickedly hard, because the sets don't necessarily align, and you have to understand what's not in there. So part of the reason that we've been able to close other enterprise deals is our IP and the knowledge graph that we've had from the hard work of putting that data together. Um, the other thing is when you get folks like the fellow who's got a diner for 20 years saying, thank you, you, you helped me make payroll because I knew folks weren't going to come by and it's going to be a quiet day. This is someone who doesn't think about open data portals and what does this all mean. It's just like, you gave me what I need to know. You put it in my hands. I can text it out to my staff to say, today's going to be quiet. Thank you. Um, and that's kind of a lot of the value behind what we do. One of the interesting things about Next Big Sound, um, I've actually, so also, I've been there for five and a half years. When I started, there were about four or five of us, and we were just starting with like the first data sources. We were looking at MySpace, because that still mattered. Um, <laughs> oh, no one from the audience is from there. Uh, and <laughs> yeah, uh, Facebook, Twitter. And we didn't necessarily know where it was going to go. It, we were all people who were just interested in music. And we're like, who's the most popular? We, we just want to have the data and go to every website day to day. And as we worked with our customers over the years, we integrated more sources and eventually figured out that the data wasn't necessarily useful to them unless they could also see it next to the data that we don't have access to. Because all we can collect is publicly available data, but they have sales data. They have marketing data. Uh, and when you marry everything together, that's when you get the really cool insights. And so a big part of our data model is really figuring out how to combine sources that have different information architecture. Uh, and also figure out where metadata plays in and how to make real life events also come out in what you're only looking at as quantitative data. Uh, and so each layer of analytics really depends on that infrastructure of really good data. Uh, and so Next Big Sound has been heavily investing in that over the last six years. At WeWork, we use data kind of in a lot of different ways uh, to benefit our members, also to, to, to benefit the growth and, and the cities and kind of the communities that we're opening our, our locations in. Um, if you guys aren't familiar with WeWork, we have 19 locations in New York now um, that we've basically kind of grown to that size in three or four years. And we're really excited. We just opened our first location in Dumbo as kind of the, the new Dumbo Heights project, um, seeing a lot of kind of really great businesses move in there. And so one of the ways that we use data is we actually acquired a New York-based company called Case Design, which is, um, for any of the nerds or anyone that's in, in buildings or architecture here, um, is a building information modeling company that, that uses technology and uses data to kind of understand how to build really efficient buildings. So when we move into a space, when we acquire a new building or, or work with a landlord to, to take a space that was never really efficient in the way that um, energy was used, the space was used to actually fit people into the space um, and, and actually connect to the community itself. Um, that's something that we're constantly kind of building out and, and using the, the, the technology that the guys from Case, and I won't bore you guys with the details, but <laughs> um, have brought to us. The way we think about WeWork is that um, the businesses, we're empowering these businesses. It's really easy to start a business today. But it's really hard to kind of have the, all the resources that a business might need um, in kind of this one little box or, or be able to basically press a button and have access to all these resources. So that's what we see ourselves providing. Um, and we're also opening up access to, to businesses to be able to become multinational, multi-city, reach out and recruit across the world. Um, across these WeWork locations. So it's another way that we're using data is actually understanding the businesses within our community, how they're growing, how they're recruiting, um, and in turn, kind of turning that data on its head and helping connect them with the right services, with the right businesses, et cetera. A great example of a service is another startup here in New York City called Bond Street we partnered with uh, in the past week or two, uh, providing a really kind of simple, transparent way for small businesses to get access to small business loans. Um, 
surprisingly, a lot of small businesses these days, even technology companies, app startups, et cetera, still go to the bank to get a loan, which is a great thing, but they don't have the ability to, to understand um, the different rates that they can get, uh, better ways to actually get access to these loans, the right t types of financing that they should be getting access to, et cetera. So through partnerships like that, we're kind of opening new opportunities and understanding how these companies are raising money, how they're growing within our ecosystem is, is really important to us. And then I would say third is just how we're changing the, the neighborhoods and the communities around us. Um, here in New York, our first location was at Lafayette and Grand. Um, tons of businesses, if, if you speak to Adam or Miguel, our, our co-founders, about when they first took that location and first opened that, that building, uh, the area was, was actually quite run down, and, and we invested a lot of money in bringing new businesses that actually activated more local businesses in the area. We've seen way more local businesses opening, and so we're actually talking to these businesses to understand how we can drive more foot traffic to them, how we can better connect them to the WeWork ecosystem, and actually get help from our community with all the different businesses that we have inside. So these are just kind of brush the surface of the ways we're using data, but um, we're, we're building some really cool tools internally to, to help us expose all these things and ultimately empower our members to use that data as well. Um, so speaking of different roles, I mean, I think we are all coming from different roles, but I'm probably the only person up here that is not working for a data or tech company. Um, so really playing a different role within that and um, our company is 30 years old, but and additionally trying to sort of move into the future in a very antiquated business. So um, I'd say the way that we use data is kind of two part. One is on the back end um, with our operators, our chefs and GMs who very much even more so than me didn't get into the restaurant business to think about data. They got into the restaurant business to think about food and hospitality. And so with that, we really try to focus on saving them time. Um, and I think that's where efficiency and tech solutions really play um, and, are, and are getting better and better in things like timekeeping and accounting and any back office solutions that, um, that were just never supported in our industry, especially before, especially for small businesses. And then on the guest side and the marketing side, um, I think there's ever more expectation from the consumer to, for businesses to have an understanding of, of what they like and what they want to do and how they um, give us a tremendous amount of their information and expect us to do something with it. So it's our job to um, take that in and try to slice and dice it the best that we can using relatively antiquated systems um, and serve up better experience. So um, we store a lot of our data in open table and POS systems. And for us, I think um, on both sides, it's really um, a question of change management and working cross-functionally to understand um, how to do that better and how to, how to extract things from relatively antiquated systems that have been around for since the 90s, really. And that's kind of the benefit and the hindrance of, um, of working for an older business where we didn't get to build things from scratch last year with open architecture and infrastructure that we wanted. <laughs> yeah. um, and speaking of data, I know uh, Danny Meyer recently announced, who runs Union Square Hospitality Group, recently announced that he's going to be eliminating tipping in his restaurants. So I'm curious if um, there was any data that went into that decision. That's a really interesting one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'd say you know the data that went into the decision was more on the financial side and um, our accounting and finance teams working through you know, relatively traditional models of just talking about how to how to um, how to make this work from a financial standpoint. But I'd say the thing that's more interesting to me, and I th and um, and I can speak better to in my role is is thinking about the future of how this will work. And you know, I think there's been a lot of talk about um, about the idea and hope and and enthusiasm. But of course, the proof is in, is going to be in the pudding and. Um, and I think part of the comfort and the confidence that we take in that is our ability to look at guest feedback in a real-time basis. And some of the systems that we've set up over the past couple of years have really allowed us to do that. So that to me is where um, a lot of this will play, where we're going to be in a much better position to be in an open dialogue with our guests and with our um, internal teams about what's going on in a real-time basis rather than trying to, you know, make decisions in the dark, so. Gotcha. Um, 
Now, what types of skills or backgrounds do you guys look for when you are looking to hire data scientists or data analysts or people who work with data for your organizations, for your companies? Um, what are you looking for? You know, what types of skills um, are, are you actually looking for in order to, to make those types of hires? How can people position themselves well? Yeah, so, um, so this, this actually um, is different for the different data roles we have in our company. So f for the algorithm team that develops the real-time algorithm that allows matching riders with vehicles and adjusting routes, then this is really um, a team that requires very, very strong kind of CS background and the ability to um, scale complex algorithms that can process thousands of requests per minute and match them to hundreds of locations of vehicles across the city. So this is a very specific skill set. Um, but for our other analytics and data science team that work more closely with the business, uh, we, we obviously al also look for, for the, the analytical kind of capabilities and skill set. But, but what's, at a sense, uh, equally important is um, the ability to, to ask the right questions. Because um, you know, if you if you don't if you don't lay out the right hypothesis, data is is just numbers, right? You need to be able to interpret it. You need to be able to tell the story, and you need people who have the nose for that, for those kind of stories, and have the curiosity to kind of dig in the data, understand what they're seeing, interpret it, and 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 also be um, you know a, a bit suspicious about what they see. So so be able to have like the the kind of the healthy. Um, Kind of the healthy um, attitude of, of of looking and being able to say, okay, this 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 feels right, this doesn't feel right, so we can actually rely on Canon on what they're seeing. So I love that you mentioned curiosity. Um, yes, we're hiring, so certainly reach out if you're interested. What's keen to our team, and we do a lot of stuff in terms of back end. You really do have to have that sort of strong chops of. Do I know what I'm looking at? Am I a curious problem solver? Am I someone that's relentless to learn? Um, in terms of our team, it's not about where you went to university or when you went to university, but show us how you think about these problems and show us a willingness to understand the context and to your point, to understand what's not in there, right? So you can say like, oh, look, we did this analysis, we did this, and it's like, yeah, but did you allow for, for example, if you're looking at 311 service requests, just because there aren't a lot of calls in one area, doesn't necessarily mean anything is everything is okay. Um, did you look at census to understand well what's the native language population? Like what are what language are folks speaking there? Sort of what's earnings and income? Like what are these other layers of context that are going on? Or like oh we saw a spike with this this yeah okay. But what are the five other layers of data sets that you're bringing in? So that relentless curiosity is huge, um, as well as you know in a startup plan like you got to be willing to work hard. You have to deal with uncertainty and fluidity. For some folks like us, that's awesome. Um, for other folks that are looking for something more uh, formalized, a larger corporation might be better. Working for a startup is an amazing opportunity if you're the kind of person that loves ownership and the chance to distinguish yourself um, and really help the team grow. For example, in our cases, we're rolling out into other cities, but that's a very different kind of value prop than coming from a larger organization. So, so a, a complicated answer to that question. Um, we have kind of three different kinds of data analysts at Next Big Sound. Um, you've got your very uh, typical data scientist. Uh, that's a very, that's like what you'd expect. It's data modeling. It's someone with a, probably a statistical background. Um, and then we have someone whose title might actually be data analyst. Uh, and that's going to be someone who works with customers directly um, and says to the customer, OK, well, what problem are you trying to solve? And then sort of works with them back and forth, figuring out what tools we have, what data we have, that helps them answer that question. And then the third, that's actually kind of the most interesting of the three, is data journalist. Um, and this was a role that sort of grew over time. Um, initially, it was just kind of in-house journalist, kind of just her blogger, owner of social media. But it turned into this real thing of data journalist, um, where, I mean, this is uh, Leave Bully. She's amazing. Um, she writes about anything interesting she sees. So we, we publish charts in Billboard. Uh, we publish an industry report annually. Um, and when something unexpected happens, she writes the really cool story. And she also has a data background to talk about, well, what are the caveats with this? And what you can see actually across all three roles, and I want to give Leave credit for really enforcing this too across all three roles, 
is there's, there's two real big things that everyone has to have. And one is, as everyone has already said, curiosity. Uh, you, have to be, you have to be interested. You have to see a set of tabular data and not go, oh, tabular data. You have to go, ooh, what's that cell? Um, like you have to be excited about it. Otherwise, it's just it's it's not gonna it's not gonna keep you coming to work every day. And the second is obviously communication. Um, if you can't tell people about the things you've found, what's the point? Uh, so that I mean that's it's just it's paramount. Um, so yeah, communication and curiosity. I don't really have too much more to add to that. You guys really touched on it. I mean, I agree. I think the biggest thing for us is actually the, the people that have succeeded in, in, in data roles at WeWork and have really stood out have actually grown into, into more product roles where they're starting to, to see these patterns or understand how we can, we can take this data and, and make our products better. Um, and I would just say that that kind of teamwork is the biggest one. Really understanding the stakeholders that are involved that that you're working with to to access this data and analyze this data, and and understanding how you can present it in in a way that's it's going to kind of drive the mission forward. That's all I would have to add. I mean, I, I think you guys really touched on it. Um, I totally agree. <laughs> we don't have any data scientists, so maybe people who can moonlight in other jobs but have knowledge. <laughs> I do actually want to uh, reiterate one thing that Eileen said about working at a startup, and specifically that sense of ownership. Um, at Next Big Sound, I mean, we're still trying to do the shift of being acquired, but uh, up in, I mean, this is still true. We have a very flat management structure, and this is—it's the only way to really stay efficient as a startup. Is you can't—you can't have someone above you telling you what to do all the time, and that's why also curiosity is so much more important. Is because no one's going to tell you what to do. You have to have that ownership, that excitement of, of actually figuring out what problem you need to solve. Uh, so more so at a startup than any, any big company, that, that ownership, that curiosity, definitely. Yeah, plus one, because it's not, all right, I'll do what you've told me. It's, I saw these other things that no one else has identified. Here's how we're taking care of them. Because it's very much the sense of we're all rowing together. And when you do that, and you've got this great energy where everyone can rely on each other for that independent, that's huge. And then the last thing is really being empathetic for your users, right? So one of the things that we look like we look at with folks is you have to empathize, you know, if we're working with shopkeepers and we're working with governments and we're working with large enterprises, you have to empathize with those users. So we're very keen for folks that are curious problem solvers, but who also come in as a how can we help solve this together versus ah oh, they don't get it, them yeah. It's like no no. If you can't be empathetic, I, I don't care what kind of stats chops you got. I need to understand you care about the folks who are involved with the problems that we're solving. Great. All right, one more question from me, and then um, if folks want to line up, I think we'll have time for one or two questions from the audience. Um, so how are your companies turning data into innovation, but also at the same time protecting the privacy of your customers? Um, that's sometimes a concern for folks. Um, you know, they want products that relate to them and services that are relevant to them and tailored experiences, but they also want to feel like their privacy is being respected. So how do you guys go about thinking about that, that sort of, um, you know, that balance when you are doing your work and creating your, um, you know, your products and services? Um, so I think we have our, and I mean, like any of you, we're very privileged to have incredibly personal information about um, people's dining habits, you know, their allergies, their spending habits, et cetera, and we take that very seriously. And, and as I said, a lot of our information is stored in open table terminals. And so last year we went through a huge project of um, data cleanup on the one hand, and it was sort of to prepare in order for all of our restaurants to be able to share information better, because I think something that probably no one understands is that um, open table, the way it's set up, is completely siloed um, between restaurants. So we don't have an open architecture between um, our group to be able to naturally share information, which is incredibly crazy. Um, so, but in order to appear that way to a guest, we're using a third-party system. And um, so, before we even went went about that process, we went through a massive data cleanup and and just really trying to look at very individually. Um, from a privacy standpoint, anything that could be coded or perceived as the way that someone wouldn't wouldn't want it to be public, and so 
kind of recoding and um, giving ourselves insider knowledge as far as what something that might be very personal to someone would appear on a screen that is, you know, for all intents and purposes, public. So people are constantly wanting to look behind the terminal and say, like, no, I want that time at my table and et cetera. So um, given that that is relatively public, um, just going through a very specific process of, um, of coding that for yourselves in the back end. Yeah, I'll speak to the first the innovation side of things. Um, there's some things that we're working on, you know, with the acquisition of case that I mentioned earlier, and, and a lot of the internal things that we're doing um, in physical space. That s very soon um, you'll start to see in the press that we're really thinking of the future work and the future office space and the physical space. So while WeWork is is building more efficient buildings faster than anyone is right now. Um, we're also building technology into our spaces to really identify people's needs throughout the space, um, how to better work with the space, connect with people across all of our buildings, being in New York and being able to connect with someone you know, in Tel Aviv or London instantly, uh, being able to collaborate together. The other side of that is um, you know, we, we really think of our, our product as community and again, connecting people in that collaboration. So we're building a lot of internal tools that are allowing our businesses to not only leverage the kind of third party services that we're working with like a Bond Street, but actually leverage the services of each other. So traditional kind of co-working space mentality is that someone sits next to you, they're a graphic designer, you need a graphic designer, you're a lawyer, maybe you're gonna barter your services together. We're actually building technology um, in app and on desktop and in, in the spaces themselves that's um, better identifying people's needs and people can self-identify for those needs and, and also for the services that they can provide and connecting those people together. So actually getting to a point where we can tell someone, not only can you build your business at, at WeWork and have access to a lot of these physical amenities cheaper than you would get them anywhere else, um, but we can actually help you find business within our community and you can actually drive real revenue from the other members within the WeWork community. Um, and then on the privacy side, I mean, everything that we do is, um, we don't take too much personal data. We do a lot of, of surveying and we do a lot around, you know, understanding how people like the physical space. Think of, you know, the Uber model after you get out of your car, it asks you to rate your driver. We do that regularly with our conference rooms and, and the physical spaces, et cetera, to kind of fully understand. And we're always testing new things. Um, but all that survey data and, and the majority of the data when we use it, it's all anonymized. Um, you know, we're, we're very uh, understanding of the privacy concerns of our members, especially a lot of these members are building startups themselves and, and are very concerned about building their, their startups and privacy, especially when they're in kind of more of a communal space. So. We're, we're very, uh, you know, obviously aware of that stuff and, and, and helping support them as much as possible. So, so much of the data that we collect is actually publicly available, so that's, there's no real privacy concern there. Um, but the data that we do get that, that is given to us from one customer that is strictly held for that one customer. There's no sharing across that. Uh, so the real, the real innovations, though, because so much of the data proposition is public, um, is figuring out how to, how to get across all these data, these different data sets. Um, and so one example is, is sort of aggregate scores. So instead of just looking at Facebook likes or just looking at your engagement on Twitter, maybe say, OK, well, what is my engagement as an artist overall? Uh, how, how popular am I? How, how much do people stream my music? Um, and, and towards that end, we you really use predictive modeling. Um, so one of the ones or one of the scores that we put out are not sure how public this is, but uh, one, uh, the Billboard 200 predictive score um, is a score from zero to 100 of of someone's likelihood to appear on the next Billboard 200. Um, and every artist within our whole system is rated on that, and it's constantly up. We have a new value every day, um, and it's it's a cross metric because the model takes in every value we track. Another, and this is, this is kind of the sexiest product we have, um, the, the sort of natural inclination when, you, when you're looking at data in the music industry is you start with a musician, you start with a band, um, and then you look at the metrics underneath that person. 
But say you aren't an artist or you're, you're not a band, you're an advertiser and you want to work with someone for an ad campaign, but all you know is you don't want them to be a megastar because that, that's expensive, but you want them to have, say, at least 50,000 Facebook likes and you want them to be kind of on the up and up in Twitter. So because people kept asking us about that, well, we made that product. Um, and that's what we call find, where you basically, you just put in a series of parameters based on the data that you want and you find the artists that match that data. And so that's, that's the, like, that was a huge innovation for us because it basically took our whole data model and flipped it upside down. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think everything we do is super sexy in terms of data, <laughs> but I think those are, those are kind of the highlights. That's wicked cool to flip sort of the model the other way. So for us, actually, innovation is about simplicity, right? And part of what we did with Mind My Business was make it really easy for shopkeepers to get onboarded. So it's basically two screens. You give me your business name and your business address and your email, and that's it. Behind the scenes, I've got a proprietary profile for every single business in New York City, so I know when you incorporated, whether or not you've had any fines, if you've got a liquor license, um, if there's construction going on in front. Based on that, that's how you get targeted alerts that are specific to you. And the feedback that we get from business owners is, this is great. I didn't have to learn anything. You didn't make me feel like, you know, listen, I'm an old timer. I don't know. It's like, this is cool. I can share this with my team. I love that. And that's also a lot of what drove our work with Neighborhoods.NYC, was making this something that's accessible for every single New Yorker, that the information is there, it's in front of you, and you don't have to go through all these learning steps. Right now, it's in a beta period, but part of what's going to happen at the end of it is communities can take over their individual neighborhood sites. So we had to think really carefully about, so what does the admin portal look like for that? If, for example, the neighborhood administrator for Dongan Hill NYC, where my father, who's a retired senior, lives, what if he wants to be in charge of it because he's active in his community? Well, he's not going to come in and say, absolutely, I know how to use Fatwire and I'm familiar with CMS and I know how to do this. this. He's going to be like, can I just like click things? Um, yeah. And that's what we did because we wanted to make it accessible for all. And that may not sound as sexy, um, but it's actually really powerful when you can engage, and that was what we were tasked with, and it was quite a privilege to work with mayor's office on this, but how do you make this such that everyone can feel included and not, there's not this ramp up of, I've got to learn Socrata and I've got to understand how to you know, do these things with data sets and analysis, and I've got to figure out how do I you know, plug snippets of code here and here. It's like, nope. This is what you can do for your management system. And you know, I kind of looked at sort of guiding precept of, is it dad proof? Um, because if, if my dad can figure it out, then, then that's a win. Um, and I don't mean that in a facetious way, but I mean it in a, we want this to appeal to everyone. So you have to think about the entire spectrum and including for all. Um, and for us, that's innovation. In terms of privacy, um, interesting thing for us is a lot of shopkeepers like asking us questions because while they may be reticent, for example, to ring up a city agency because of an unsupported fear that they might get a fine, they don't mind asking us a question like, so how do I do this or how do I do that? And then we can get back to them. So we try to build trust in everything that we do um, and in the information that we choose not to share. Another reason that um, the shopkeepers like us is we're not saying, hey, listen, I see you recently got fined for roaches. Why don't you use you know, such and such exterminating business? We're not exposing that um, because for us, that's how we lose the trust and the respect of our users. And that, more than anything, is what innovation is about, making it simple and making it such that folks want to trust you and work with you for the long term. So um, for us, from an innovation perspective, we, we can actually use all the data um, that we're seeing. We're seeing where are people requesting rides, where are people going, and how that changes across time. And we can use all, that da all this data to improve the system on an ongoing basis. So for example, you know, unlike a, a, a fixed route system where you know, the bus schedule is the bus schedule, we can actually say, you know, if, this is, you know, if today is going to rain, how much demand we expect to have this afternoon on the Upper West Side given you know, it's, it's, a, it's a Tuesday and it's public school holiday. And we can use algorithm to, to predict that. And as a result, we can, we can adjust how many, how many vehicles we have around that area. So we, 
we, be, we, we meet our demand in a more efficient way and provide a better service to our members. Uh, so this is, this is one example of how we use data. Um, another example is we, we use our data to, to better understand what our customers' preferences are. So one, one of the... Um, one of the interesting things about our service is we, you know, you, you book our service on a mobile app, very similar to kind of other, um, other, other taxi apps that you have on your phone. But we would not pick you up from your doorstep or where you are. We would, we would tell you to walk to a virtual bus stop, so we would not have to go into cross-town traffic or, or get into different, different loops just to pick up people from their exact location. But um, what, what we've found is it's very interesting to look at, at um, people's preferences when we potentially offer them a few options. You can, for example, if you're on Fifth Avenue and you're booking a car to go uptown, we can offer you to go up to Madison or go up to Sixth Avenue. It's, it's a different walking distance. But if we, if we give you different wait times for those walking distance, we can actually <coughs> learn what people prefer in the trade-off between walking and wait time. So we, we use all that data and all that information to, to design the system to better fit the needs of our members. And, and as regard to privacy, we, we take a lot of care in our, in our members' kind of, um, privacy. Uh, we, we don't keep information that we, we don't have any business keeping. We don't keep credit card information. Uh, we have very strict policies around you know, who can access uh, member data and who cannot access member data. We would never sell uh, member data, so um, you know, we, and we have policies around how to, how to use it in general. So and that's, that's kind of how we keep our members' privacy. Great. We have time for one question, if there are any. I don't see anyone at the... Okay, one over there. Hi, Mr. Kessler. I wanted to ask you, um, it was my understanding when they opened Charlton Street years ago that the concept was to be to group different types of people together. For, for example, you had all the architects, designers, et cetera, et cetera, and you know, we could all, all figure out different occup other occupations where you could do the same thing. Where do you see that going, that concept? It's a great question, actually. Um, we're working on a, a really amazing um, project in, in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And, and, and part of that project is we're, we're starting to understand, um, in an area where there aren't too many businesses, what, what types of businesses are kind of surrounding and, and what types of businesses would, would thrive in this em environment where they're working together. The biggest part of that is actually the physical resources that you provide them. So we've talked to numerous uh, companies and people in the space uh, around things like shared kitchen space, um, shared maker space, so having access to you know, CNC machines and things like that. Um, we've experimented, you're right, we've experimented with it on, on Varick Street. We had a floor that was kind of architecture and design focused. Um, we've learned that you have to invest a lot in actually managing the floor, providing the tools, and, and providing the right experience. <laughs> And so for us, the, the utmost important thing for us is the member experience and providing that support. So we're figuring out the best way to, to kind of either partner with the right companies to bring them in, whether it might be a maker bot on the 3D printing side or someone in the, in the actual you know, lab space for, for science lab space. So this is something that we're, we're doing, and I would just say there's more to come. And I, I definitely, uh, we think there's a lot of opportunity there. The biggest one that I'm most interested in being kind of an a, a, a amateur cook myself is uh, there's a, lot, a, a huge need. We've been seeing a, a big uptick in companies in WeWork locations, especially in New York, that are working on um, either food products or, or pop-ups or food trucks and things like that, and they need space, and they want to connect with other similar businesses, kind of share those ideas and, and innovations on those sides. So uh, all I can say right now is more to come for sure. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Ben. All right, let's hear from our panelists. <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right, so we're going to move on to our third panel of the day, so if the panelists can join me up here. Okay, no problems. Yeah, we should be fine. Thank you so much, Jimmy. Hey guys, how are you? Hey, Drew. Yeah, you just don't. No worries. No worries. Alrighty. So this is our closing panel of the day, um, another awesome one, and the topic is data for social good. 
Um, so we've heard about smarter cities uh, from both Rachel in the first panel. We've heard um, from companies in the privacy in industry, both startups and, and more traditional brick and mortar restaurants or stores. Um, and now we're going to talk about uh, data in the social sector. Um, so when you start off, like we started the other panels, just running down with intros for the group. So I'll start. My name is Drew Conway. I um, uh, currently am CEO and founder of a startup here in the city called Alluvium. Um, we actually build integrated analytics for uh, large industrials with uh, deployments of physical assets. I've also uh, co-founded an organization called Datakind, which is probably more pertinent to this panel. Um, I was also an advisor in the previous administration's uh, Mayor's Office of Data Analytics, so I've actually done a lot uh, sort of analyzing data in the social sector. I'm Toby Bloom. I'm at the New York Genome Center. Um, the New York Genome Center is a nonprofit clinical genomics research center. And, and what that means is that um, our goal is to find the underlying causes of diseases um, at the molecular level, at the DNA level, um, and then find treatments for those diseases. So our aim is to improve health now. And the way we do that is by, by generating huge amounts of genome sequence data and analyzing it to try to figure out the differences in DNA that can raise the risk or cause diseases. My name is Clayton Banks. I'm the co-founder of Silicon Harlem. And if you don't mind, I'd like to thank Google and, of course, the Manhattan Chamber of Commerce. Uh, if you don't belong to a chamber, I would encourage you to do it. I d I've done it, and it's, it's paid dividends. Silicon Harlem is designed to transform Harlem into a tech and innovation hub. And the idea behind that is to create a sustainable economic engine in uptown. This includes, as the last panel talked about, co-working spaces, incubators, um, marrying ourselves with Wall Street, Harlem and Wall Street on the same island. Somehow we got to get married. And uh, so we got to power our startup uh, community. And we uh, sort of created our whole organization and movement around data. So we'll talk more about that as we go. Um, I'm David Kolker. I'm the director of systems and production at God's Love We Deliver. Um, we're 30 years old. Uh, we're one of the, one of the largest uh, nonprofit home delivered meal programs in the city. Um, we just moved into a 48,000 square foot new space in Soho at 6th and Spring. Um, I manage delivery IT meal packaging, and I also oversee um, inventory. I'm a Tony Foligno. I oversee uh, planning and evaluation at the Advertising Council. Um, you might recognize us from campaigns like Smokey Bear, although you probably wouldn't see Smokey in the middle of Manhattan, but <laughs> he's out there. And uh, friends don't let friends drive drunk. Um, drunk driving prevention, I mind, is a terrible thing to waste. What you probably don't know is that we're heavily invested involved with digital and social uh, marketing programs. All of it borrowing techniques from the commercial marketing sector, including data techniques, but all for the purpose of uh, inspiring and motivating people to take an action that either benefits themselves or their family or their community. And um, I love my job, but I can say it, as a lot of people here who are in the marketing space or in the media space right now, my job is, I was, I've been at the Ad Council for about 15 years, it's unrecognizable compared to when I first started. And the main reason for that is the, uh, the amount of data I have at my disposal. Great. Again, what a collection of people. I mean, how often do you see uh, on stage together, you know, folks from the nonprofit world, uh, a doctor, um, you know, folks in uh, the tech space, incubator space, um, just a really interesting group of people that are all doing innovative uh, work for social good. So uh, really, again, pleased with, with such a great speakers, a speaker lineup. Um, so first question for you guys is, um, sort of broad, in broad strokes, how are your organizations using data for social good? How are you leveraging the power of data for social good? Um, and how do you quantify the impact that your work, that your work is having? having? Um, and also, are there specific examples you can give the audience um, to make it more concrete? So anyone can feel free to start. I'll start. I'll start at the end. Uh, you know, we have three main uses for our data and our analytics. The first is planning, and I think planning in the marketing space is simply listening, listening to the people you're trying to uh, reach. And um, there's many different methodologies you can get to that singular insight that's going to drive your campaign. The second and probably the most important is uh, evaluation. I think, you know, it allows you 
I have more information about how our programs are working now than I ever did before. And the third, and I think one is that overlooked, it's uh, best practices. And I think that's one of the things that I spend a lot of time with. When you're sitting on a lot of data as an organization, it's still very easy to get caught up in the day to day. You know, so what, what your immediate task at hand is and what best practices and sort of in our case cross campaign research allows us to do is, you know, avoid repeating mistakes that we've made in the past and be able to uh, replicate our successes. So those are the three main areas I do. And, you know, for the Ad Council and this, uh, success metrics across organizations are going to be different across the board. For us, it's a behavior. Each one of our campaigns asks you to do something. It could ask you not to get behind the wheel if you've been drinking. It could ask you to maintain um, a, a certain sort of level of health and uh, healthy lifestyles. It could be talk to your doctor if you suspect that your child might be showing some symptoms or signs of autism. Those are the things. So all of our metrics always funnel down to a bottom line, a bottom line sort of, for lack of a better word, sale, but it's a behavior uh, of some sort. I'll just say, um, my God. Uh, for us, uh, we, we say that food is love. I'll just I'll turn it off. Oh, uh, I got it. So um, we deliver 1.4 million meals a year. There you go. Am I on now? There you go. We deliver 1.4 million meals a year, but uh, the data really makes that love happen. Um, we go to 900 addresses every day, and we have HIPAA data compliant, we have HIPAA compliant data on all our clients. Um, we use routing software, we use uh, forecast, it, forecast modeling for our food production. So the data really, really drives our business and we couldn't do it without, without the data. Um, and we, we, hear from, we hear from our clients if we're doing a good job. So. Oh, okay. I know they're going to mistake me for the doctor, but this is the doctor over here. No, I'm sorry. I'm not a doctor. I'm just, I'm actually a computer scientist. Um, the, the doctor is a PhD, not an MD. Uh, apologies for the confusion, um, especially since I'm, I'm at a health center. Um, it's kind of interesting because I think we use data very differently than most places use big data. Most places are aggregating data that was collected for lots of different purposes and trying to put it to good use um, for, for other purposes. When our whole company is about data, our organization is about data, um, we generate the data by sequencing DNA, right? We start with little tubes of goop and we generate long strings of ACs, Ts, and Gs. And then we have to look at the, that data, and I don't know how much data other people have. We generate tens of terabytes a day of data, um, if that means anything to anybody. Um, and we, we analyze that data to try to figure out how differences in the, in, in the genetic makeup of different people influences their disease risk or causes certain symptoms. Um, and so, you know, we found the genetic cause of, of an adolescent liver cancer. And there are now two drug companies that are, um, that are working on a, a treatment for that cancer. There was none before. Um, we did that in, in collaboration with, with a couple of, of other organizations in the city, but but those are the kinds of things we want to do. So have I saved a life yet? Maybe not. We're working, we have a clinical brain cancer study going on now where we're looking at the DNA of individual patients with brain cancer and trying to figure out from that what the best treatment would be of the available options. Um, so that's how we use the data, if that answers the question. Okay. Well, for us, <clears throat> There's a couple of things that, and I know I'm standing in between you guys and beer and wine, so I'm going to be quick, but <laughs> there's a couple of things that were really um, very evident to us. One is historically. So if you look historically um, at the uh, United States, 100 years ago, uh, a little more over 100 years ago, um, the percentage of African-American males in prison is about the same as it is today. 
So that is, if you take just those two data points, there's something wrong with perhaps how we see uh, criminality. 110 years ago, you could sort of attribute it to the fact that a slave couldn't be in prison because they didn't have any rights, they didn't go to any courts, they didn't go anything like that. But as soon as Emancipation Proclamation happens, boom. You're, you're actually, you're, the number of people in prison of color just shot up. And it's maintained for over 100 years. So the question becomes, in our, in, at least from our perspective, is um, have we as a society looked at that uh, from the systemic perspective? Where, where data, because data and criminal data started at that same time, and it was able to justify the laws and, 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 and uh, procedures that were put in place to put people in jail. Hey, if there's a lot of African American males in jail, they must be prone to criminality, so we have to build more jails and we have to create more laws to make sure that we're capturing those criminals. And I think most of us today would say that doesn't make sense, however, when you look at what's happening with what we heard earlier today about, you know, uh, stat, uh, Comstats, uh, Comstats 2.0, if you will, that Bratton's talking about, uh, predictive criminals predicting crime, to me that's obviously a uh, threat on our own constitutional rights. If you already, as far as I knew, you're supposed to be innocent before uh, until proven guilty. So. All of these things led us to think we need to make sure uh, that we have a seat at the table when we're talking about data sets that are informing our systems to put things in place and put a layer of value on that that makes sense. We have to put some value on what we're doing. This, let's don't put technology before our values. You know, and, and let's make sure that we are putting in systems that are gonna be fair. So Silicon Harlem, doesn't look at this as sort of a black thing, it looks, like, looks at it as a community thing. How does the community come together and make sure that systematically we are broaching the problems or issues or challenges that we face as a community? It redounds to economic development, obviously. And just those two data points were some, something phenomenal, but here's one other one that I'll just throw out, and I'll talk a little bit, a little bit more later about what we're doing about it and, and how we measure it. But 1.7, we, we should say one out of seven African-American boys, we think, we don't have enough evidence yet, but we think go to college. But empirically, absolutely factual, we know that 1.3 will go, one out of three will go to jail. And that's a problem. They're not born criminals. There's something wrong with some of our systems that we have to take a look at and approach. So we take it from that perspective and build an ecosystem where we can, um, you know, sort of deal with those realities. So uh, I will uh, try to be brief. The um, my work really begins where the where the data starts, and so really in all the work that I've done, building companies or working in the social sector, uh, the idea is really how do you build a data product that is empathetic to the human delivering the service and is not attempting to replace that person, but simply make them better through the deliberate analysis of data. So, you know, examples of this at Datakind, which I should say is a nonprofit organization here in New York that matches pro bono engineers and data scientists to social sector groups who lack the resources to employ those people full time to, to do projects specifically in the service of trying to improve the delivery of whatever the service is that they're doing. Um, you know, we work really hard to make sure that when we're interacting with those social sector groups or when I was working in the mayor's office, you know, those, those city service groups, we know that we don't know how to deliver that service better than the individuals who do it. What we know how to do is look at a data set, look at a problem through data, and try to make that more efficient and, and more optimized. Um, so the way that we measure success is, have we actually been able to improve the delivery of that service, and then perhaps culturally on the back end, has there been an adoption of data-driven decision-making at the executive or management level in those organizations? Gotcha. Um, I think in general, nonprofits don't get enough credit when it comes to things like innovation and specifically data-driven innovation. Um, why do you guys think that may be, and um, what are you doing to sort of prove them wrong? Okay, I'll start this time. Um, I think it might be because 
nonprofits are interested in a mission that isn't the data. They're using the data for their mission. So I'm not that interested in being known for doing very sophisticated analysis on huge amounts of data. I want to be known for curing diseases and, and improving public health. I'll, I'll say that in my experience, I think this one of the realities of working in the social sector is a big part of being in the social sector is raising money to continue the mission. And I think unfortunately, that gets the data analysis gets mixed up too much into how much money are we spending or saving and less on how much of what we're doing is focused on the delivery of the service. And so there's a bit of an aversion, I think, to thinking about data driven in that way because the two get conflated uh, in an unfortunate way. And, and part of what we try to do is to disentangle that. Uh, I'll also, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll say what, one thing is when I, when I uh, present to the board, our board is mostly corporate sort of advertising and media people, or when I uh, present to outside sort of corporate groups, I always sort of shocked that we use data at all. It's sort of like this sort of back end compliment, you know, like you didn't fall off the turnip truck. I'm so surprised. But I think at the same time, um, if you're working within the industry, I think you would realize there's lots of change and innovation happening. I think in the two decades that I've been in the nonprofit sector, the real watchwords have become accountability, have become metrics, have become impact. And not impact in some generalized sense, but establishing goals and measuring impact. And it's much tougher, I think, for nonprofits to measure their impact than for for-profits or for businesses. I think the challenges are entirely different, but I think it's also, in a lot of ways, it's tougher. Um, the one side, I think, um, you know, that is justified is, as you mentioned, we are leanly resourced, you know? Um, Google's don't need a data kind sort of service. They, they've, got, they've got enough uh, resources in-house, but you know, organizations like the Ad Council does. And the other thing I think, and it's a, sort of an unfair, but when you think of government or nonprofit organizations or working for the social good, um, risk taking, you know, sort of the, the last group that we were in, sort of the entrepreneurial risk taking flat organizational sort of style where you're not afraid to fail. It's sort of foreign to a lot of these sort of larger organizations and nonprofits, and it's sort of tough to actually convince them that these new ways of doing business are actually going to help with their impact. Um, I'll just follow up with that. I think that from my perspective, I'm always looking for the best of breed that I can buy, but I also want something very reliable because we make deliveries every day. So I can't set up something that won't be sustainable. Um, another thing that I think for from my perspective for nonprofits, it's very important is that your systems talk to each other. Like I want my CRM to talk to the routing software, to talk to the new, new document management system, and then the new call center, so, so that everything becomes very accessible and transparent because we have too slim a staff to like be taking pieces of paper around to each other. So I think that's, it's, that's a huge win to me. I'm not sure if uh, I agree 100 percent that nonprofits are not known for innovation. I, I do believe there's, they should be known for other things, um, including whatever their mission is, they should try to get that finished. Um, but when uh, the Haiti crisis happened, it was innovation from the nonprofit sector that helped you know sort of help rebuild that country. And that's been throughout the history of America is that nonprofits have led the way and finding new ways to solve problems. And that's innovation in and of itself. And they use that data that's been shared with for-profit uh, companies to allow for companies that are thriving today. So I think there's something good about all of that. I think the struggle, as, as we've heard, and I agree with 100%, is that a lot of the time, a nonprofit is spending time trying to raise money. So the... Um, the, the fact that so much of their resources is dedicated towards just building the infrastructure of their nonprofit takes away from their ability to hire a bunch of data scientists and look at data and, and uh, come up with new innovations. But I do think they do the best they can. My personal feeling is that a nonprofit should be in the business of going out of business. They should try to solve the problem. That's great. Um, Next question for you guys. Curious if you have ever borrowed any sort of data best practice uh, from other um, companies, organizations, industries, where you've just seen someone doing something really interesting that seemed to move the needle for them, and sort of start, start to think about, you know, how can I apply this or implement this in my organization? Um, any sort of unexpected data usage uh, or practice that you've seen that you've tried to uh, bring over to, to your mission? 
I'll say this as since I work so closely with the uh, the ad and the marketing industry and the media industry, uh, I borrow everything. I steal everything. You know, all the, their best techniques. I, I'm, uh, I'm I'm embarrassed to say it. I think um, because um, and they're willing to share it because it's all for a good cause. I I think the most recent sort of thing that I've been doing lately, and I actually have a dedicated analyst on staff, is looking at social media data. I think you know a lot of companies right now are understanding who their advocates are, who their critics are, what the conversation is like going on online. Um, um, who the competition is, right? And same goes for the nonprofit. And I think, you know, it's not like a survey where you get a representative view of the public. You get the people who really, really love your cause and the people who really, really hate your cause. And you don't get a lot of the mushy middle. But it helps us identify what the conversation is and who you can enlist you know, actually to amplify your message. And I think the technology is fantastic and, and it's been invaluable over the past two, three years for us. And we're just really following the lead of the, you know, the Nikes and the, you know, the Procter and Gambles of the world. And I think part of it is just what you can access. We just did a NYU capstone project and looking at uh, our senior population and where the possible growth can be for our, for our services and they had access to data that we would have never been, been able to get to. So I think that you just have to kind of, you, you do have to reach out and get some outside resources to help you along the way. If anyone in here is planning to be a data scientist if you, or you are a data scientist, I'm gonna give you something very basic to think about, which is how you, f how you actually set up your file structure. <laughs> Believe it or not, um, you know, being able to access data comes from your ability to properly file, properly tag, properly, properly metadata, all of these sort of key things so that it can be retrieved and uh, scrubbed and visualized. And so it's really important that we don't overlook, you know, we're sort of at that end thing, oh, here's the data, but there's a lot of stuff that has to happen to make that data retrievable, and what happens if the person who was, who was in charge of data leaves? So you have to make sure that it is tagged in a way that anyone could pick up from where they left off. So I'm just sorry to be a little basic, but I think it's important that if there's some, I heard there were some students in here, think about that. Yeah, no PDFs is what Ben Wellington taught. And no PDFs, today. right? <laughs> yes. I so agree with that. It is so critical. Um, you know, I think I have to say that with the amount of data and the complexity of what we're doing, we're always looking for good ideas. Um, I think the most obvious one was that we approached IBM a while ago and said, gee, could Watson. Um, possibly find the connections between DNA mutations and dr in, for a specific disease and the drugs that might be the best treatments for those diseases faster than our scientists could. Um, and we initiated a collaboration with them um, that's still ongoing. Um, but I think on the infrastructure side, we also discovered that statisticians hate databases. Mm -hmm. They want their data in flat files. But if their data is in flat files, it's much harder to use. And so I spent a bunch of time talking to statisticians trying to figure out why on earth they hated the way they, the data was being stored. Um, and we actually did find databases that would satisfy their needs. Um, and, and so, you know, we, 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 we borrowed some data I've actually bought specific database technology to solve that problem. But it's that same infrastructure problem. If you can't get to the data the way you need it, um, it's not useful. Um, I will say as a prerequisite to working with a nonprofit, data kind of requires machine readable data to actually start, with machine readable data and a question that we can actually go after. Um, I, I agree with everything that's been said. I mean, I will say I sort of sit in an awkward position as mostly coming from the commercial world as a, in the startup world, um, but we're, but Datacon is very much a startup itself. And so um, I've seen best practices bleed both ways and really nice stuff. So, you know, when we hold an event and we have social sector organizations come participate and they see how our volunteers who typically work as engineers in large companies like Google or smaller companies um, and the kind of agile software development processes that they use over the course of a short period of time, uh, we often see those kind of aha moments happening just at the process level. Uh, and then I think the other way that it goes that's interesting to me, having observed and worked with 
the with social sector organizations is social sector organizations are really good at understanding the why and and the who of, of what they are and, and the reason that they exist. Oftentimes technology companies are much worse at doing that because they're excited about building a thing. They haven't thought really about who they are or why they exist. And so this notion of a kind of purpose statement that is very natural in the social sector is much less natural to many technology startups and have found it to be a very useful um, exercise that I've learned from the social sector. That's great. Um, last question for me. If you guys have questions, feel free to line up uh, the two microphones. Um, what are the biggest challenges for using data to solve really big, tough social problems? Um, and how can we uh, overcome those challenges? Uh, volume, I think, might be a, a big one. I, I, when I first started my job at the Ad Council 15 years ago, I, I joked that, you know, people would ask me, is, is this working? Is this campaign working? And I said, I don't know. Is it working? And they said, you're the research guy. You should know. And I said, I really didn't have enough data to do my job. And now my, my problem is exactly the opposite. There's almost too much data out there. And this notion of not going down against false leads, being able to separate the signal from the noise, being able to put a narrative, not only what the data means, but like what to do with it, I think that's where I see a lot of organizations getting tripped up. They fall so in love with their data sets and all the strategic plans they could put together based on it. You don't actually see them act on it in, in the right way. So keeping it simple, which was, I think, a, a, a thing that's you know, the most challenging aspect, but I think it's also the most promising aspect because most of the solutions I've seen in the nonprofit sector are sort of people hadn't thought about it but are disarmingly simple, you know? And I think that's one of the things that good data analysis yields. I will, I will say the, the, the hardest or the, the biggest difficulty um, for data is actually not really the data at all. I think many organizations are getting much better at handling some of the fundamental technology issues that go with collecting data. It's that big social problems are really big and complex and measurement is near impossible. The measurement that is done is biased either on purpose by the nature of the mandate by which it was collected or the person who's analyzing it doesn't actually know why the data was generated in a way that it was. So asking a real easy question like does X cause Y is basically impossible and so we have to be really, really good econometricians and statisticians but also really, really good communicators and listeners uh, and so that gets back to a different kind of education that often doesn't happen in the computer sciences or in the statistical, or all that. certainly in, in, in good statistics programs it would. Um, but that to me is the biggest challenge, um, sort of getting our heads around the limits to what we can answer in the social sector. Um, I guess I'm still in the position of needing more data. We need a tremendous amount of data to make the kinds of discoveries that we need to. Um, the best example of that I can give is that a couple of years ago, there was a discovery of a rare variant that protected against type 2 diabetes. Um, it took 150,000 <coughs> patients to find that. We didn't do it. Somebody else did it. It took 150,000 genomes. That's a huge amount of data, and it's hard to find the people who will donate their DNA um, and understand the implications of giving their DNA for medical research to be able to find things like that. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of an advertisement here. We launched a website last week called DNA Land, DNA.land. If anybody has gotten their genome sequenced by 23andMe or Ancestry.com or any of those sites, if you would go to DNA.land, and just fill out a simple form, you can, up, you, you can get us your data for the research we need. Um, and that's really important. Um, so I'd like to say that. And I guess there's one other thing that's really getting in our way, and that's that we don't have enough data scientists. We don't have enough people who understand how to, an how, how to do the kinds of complex analysis we need. And if there's anybody out there who's interested, I don't care so much if you know anything about biology or genomics. I need you to know about machine learning tools and statistics and Bayesian analysis, and I'm looking to hire. <laughs> but I can't pay as much as Wall Street. Um, I, um, I'll be very quick, but I'll, I'll say I love what Aileen's doing with neighborhoods. NYC because one of the challenges that we have in this area is sharing 
and really sort of collaborating and putting together more of a comprehensive look at data that we all collect. I serve as a commissioner for New York City on, on the Commission for uh, Public Information and Communications, and the whole idea is to allow for the residents and the, our city to benefit from all the data that the city collects. And my take on it and the challenge I think we always have is how we connect everyone so that everyone can now benefit from the collective. And that's really the challenge I think we have overall. The other part would be, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, data and algorithms will lead to uh, ideas and innovations and to some degree solutions. But if we don't put a layer of of our own as a society values on top of that, it can also be dis destructive, literally. And so that's something that we really put a lot of focus on, is put uh, a little bit of our own society values in it so that when we do come up with a solution, it will actually work and be beneficial. Um, I'll just say that I think uh, from my hat as an IT person, but also someone who works, who knows what it costs to run the business. I think data is super important to articulate your needs and to tell your story. And I think that for nonprofits, that's something to really re remember. Because when you tell the story, sometimes great things happen. We have a whole Cisco backbone on our new building. And we told a funder, two weeks later, they wrote a check for it all. So I mean, I think that you can, you can really uh, do a lot with just tell, I gotta get to know your friends, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, and, but you know, we told the story in a really data-supported way. Great. Alrighty. Um, we have time for maybe one or two questions. Just over there. Hello, I'm an undergraduate student, and thank you all for coming today. This question is directed for Tony Fileno. The way I see it is that a lot of companies are using data to sell, 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 and customize their products so that we can, so that they can see what the customer wants, and we kind of indulge them in their buying habits. But for the advertising council, it seems that as opposed to selling things and indulging people, the, you're trying to change people's behavior. Let's prevent fires, don't do this and don't do that. How does data go into your strategy for these ads? Um, well, I'll say, well, first off, just it allows us to be more nimble. If something's working, we don't have to wait a year to find out um, that it's not working. We can know pretty much right away through tools like Google Analytics and other things. Um, but I think, you know, I. I'm not going to cast dispersions on um, the marketing or the media industries that I work with, the incredible talent. I will say, though, that um, um, the thing that they're really good at, that we aspire to be good at, is um, understanding uh, the consumer, understanding the target audience, putting them front and center, not putting your needs or your goals or your mission. What's going to incentivize, entice them to actually take an action that's actually for their own good or for the good of their families or something like that? And through that, requires a lot of data and it requires a lot of listening, you know, both qualitative and quantitative. And it's one of those things that, you know, we, I work with a lot of the cool ad agencies, you know, with the chunky glasses and the blue jeans and the cool sneakers and everything, and they're really hip. And then we're reaching people who are, you know, not, not those kind of people. And so we use the research to bridge that divide. And uh, we use the data to do so. And, and we, use a, we use a lot of techniques that, uh, that commercial marketers have perfected. Thank you. All right, last question. I'll be short, okay? My name is Peichun Ma. I'm also from Brew College. I'm the professor of the uh, statistics and uh, CI, uh, computer information systems. Uh, some, some of the earlier panel has answered a, a part of the question uh, about what kind of people or uh, uh, the industries are higher. Uh, Dr. Van Bloom, particularly, I mean, I ask uh, our audience to see uh, whether there's any uh, uh, data scientist I've been teaching this field I mean, for the past 28 years. I've seen up and downs of the ITs. Uh, because I have experienced them I mean, uh, during the dot-com boom and when all the industry are looking for the uh, new blood and, uh, and there's a shortage in the market. 
And I'm very excited to see, I mean, data science and you know, data analytics today, I mean, with all this booming industry. Uh, but my question is, I mean, do you have uh, experienced the shortage of the talent that you're hiring? Uh, if you do, I mean, then uh, I have seen one phenomenon uh, during the dot-com boom is uh, for all these uh, the new startup companies are going back to school and recruit them in the interns. Uh, I have been intern uh, coordinator for the past 18 years, so I've seen a lot of ups and downs. Uh, one thing that I think I would like to uh, uh, mention is uh, from the market uh, uh, meltdown in 1987, from 87 to 97, for 10 years, the enrollment of computer science in this entire country dropped to 50% because I mean, the people lack of interest in going back to school to hire students. So I think one thing to uh, kind of foster I mean, the students to come into the field is to have employers to come to school and trying to recruit uh, interns and trying to recruit students actively. I mean, so create an atmosphere so students will be uh, uh, kind of exciting to get into the field. Uh, Baruch, our department actually just started the data analytics program this year. So, uh, you know, sooner we will have uh, uh, people available to hire. Uh, I, I understand, I mean, in the city, I mean, there are a few other schools also have similar programs. Uh, but I think with the industry support coming back to school, and then, uh, uh, you know, soon, I mean, when, when there is shortage, I mean, then, you know, the cost is going to shut up. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I don't know who can answer my question or, or who has already have a program in place now. I mean, I know my students uh, have interns with uh, uh, MTA and also with a few uh, uh, city agencies. I mean, I also had an intern, used to work for uh, Ed Council before. I mean, this is the back in the dark and boom years. Okay. So this is a little bit comment and a question. Thank you. Um, just so you know, the New York Genome Center does have a summer internship program. Um, and yes, we should try to get in touch with you and come talk to your students about the internship program and about computational biology in particular. The only thing I'll, I'll add to that is uh, a program here in New York called hackny.org. Yes, yeah. So for the students in the room who may, or professors who haven't heard of it, it's a great opportunity for students who are interested in working at local startups to have exposure to the problems that they're working on and potentially intern with them. Yeah, I think uh, I, I have my students going to Yeah, I think we've, we've heard a little bit about Wall Street. I think the, uh, the slogan of Hack and Wise, keep the kids off the street, and by the street, they mean Wall Street. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll just say, just on a general note, because it was a theme throughout all three panels today, um, there's not a shortage of data scientists out there, and there's more than, a, more than a number of people who are willing to work for less money for a good cause. I've seen it again and again, that the applications pile in every time there's a position open in my group. I think there's a lack of data scientists that I want to hire, and I think that's a big difference. And I think that the schools and the programs and things are very good at teaching technical skills, maybe not as good at teaching communication skills. And I think, I'll, I, I interview a lot of applicants who are either really good at one or the other, right? They're really good on the technical <coughs> side and they can sit in front of their spreadsheet all day and crunch the numbers and be great, or they're really good at taking somebody else's work and sort of explaining it to the client. But when I find somebody who can do both, that's gold, and I, I, it's very, very, it's still very hard to find, at least in my sector. Well, or, or just to be, to be sure, I mean, uh, actually, uh, uh, Dr. Brown mentioned about the data scientists, I mean, uh, you know, have two kind of uh, things difficult to deal with. One is statistician that wants to deal with the flat file, and the computer science deals with the uh, database. So when we create this program, actually, we have a good understanding of this. So uh, all the students have to take the database as well as statistics. Uh, the Brook actually are the programs in the business school, so uh, all, all students need to take communication courses, also business courses. So they have better understanding about the, the problem domain itself. Got it. I'm sensing that people are ready for drinks. <laughs> so uh, I want to say thank you to our third panel. Thank you, guys. Alrighty, and thank you all to you guys for coming. Um, it was a really fabulous event. I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. And then drinks and hors d'oeuvres are in the back, so we hope you all will join us. Thanks.